Over the last couple years, I've taken a slow but deep dive into the animated filmography of a certain kooky Japanese cult, which has been an interesting experience, to say the least. Nietzsche's. <laughs> God is dead! God is dead! God is dead! Happy Science believes that their founder is the living incarnation of the ultimate god above all other gods. A belief that's been somewhat complicated in the last year by the fact that he is no longer alive, but his official biography on their website fails to mention that fact, even though they have updated the website to market a new film that he's apparently producing. So I guess straight up denials how they're dealing with that. Fun! Anyway, I thought it would be fun to take all of my reviews slash roast type things of all nine of their increasingly insane films, rework the interstitials to flow together a little better, and mash them all up into one big video that you can put on to sleep or do homework or eat a really long meal over. I don't know. I don't have happy science leader powers. I can't channel the spirits of people who are still alive to ask yours what you're going to do with this video. I'm just a YouTuber with editors who need to get paid while we're busy moving to Japan and can't make much new content. So, you know, why not slap a fresh coat of paint on some of my best old content and see how that thing other YouTubers do does for me. I hope you enjoy this extended deep dive into the cult that makes anime. You don't get rich writing science fiction. If you want to get rich, you start a religion. L. Ron Hubbard said that a few years before a very lucrative career change, and while the pay gap from stockbroker to indie messiah is a bit slimmer, one has to imagine similar thoughts running through the head of Takashi Nakagawa as he plotted his exit from the New York office of a prestigious Tokyo trading firm in 1986. Ever since, he's gone by Ryuho Okawa, El Kantare to his marks, uh, disciples, for the followers of Happy Science, already Japan's biggest and most influential religion according to itself, see him not just as their founder and leader, but as God's own vessel on Earth. That's God's with the apostrophe after the S. See, Okawa is Elohim, Buddha, Hermes, Thoth, the King of Atlantis, El Miore, God King of Ancient Venus, and a few other deities he made up, all rolled up into one big super god, who also happens to be best buddies with all the other gods and prophets of every other world religion, especially whichever one will convince you to give him money right now, perhaps starting with 15 bucks for a CD that repels a certain virus. But that's not all. Through the power of seance, he's even spoken to a wide range of famous secular figures throughout history, like Albert Einstein, Princess Diana, Margaret Thatcher, Freddie Mercury, Justin Trudeau, Donald Trump, and Barack Obama, some of whom, you'll note, aren't even dead yet. He's just that good. And all of whom, when asked, will tell you that Japan has never committed any war crimes ever, and also they really need to remilitarize and maybe carpet bomb North Korea. Coincidentally, that's also the official platform of the Happiness Realization Party, Happy Science's political arm. Which would be very worrying if they had anywhere near the 11 million worldwide followers they claim to have. Lucky they're lying. But as every megachurch pastor knows, it's not about the size of your congregation, it's about how hard you can milk them. And milk them happy science does, to the tune of a reported $45 million in annual revenue, which they use, among other things, to commission lengthy and ludicrous anime depictions of their scripture. And that, of course, is why we're all here today. Selling fake medicine to the sick and vulnerable during a pandemic and co-opting people's deeply held spiritual beliefs in order to lighten their wallets is just good old-fashioned capitalism after all. But using anime to do it? 
Now that's some real fucking blasphemy right there. So today, I'm gonna use everything I know about mocking bad anime to eviscerate every one of their feature-length dumpster fires. But first, before we can get to those, there's another shockingly significant short film we need to talk about. Clocking in at just 15 minutes, the 1991 OVA Shiawasate Nani, or what is happiness is mostly a footnote in the history of happy science, but it's extra footnotable for also being a footnote in the history of, I shit you not here, Kyoto Animation. In fact, it was their first ever solo anime, and it marked the directorial debut of Tatsuya Ishihara, the director of, among other things, Nichijo. It's neither of their best work. In fact, it's pretty much the worst and ugliest thing either the director or the studio has ever made, but everyone's gotta start somewhere even if that somewhere is cult propaganda. Not that you'd really know it from the OVA itself. The story follows a kid who's bummed out because a teacher yelled at him as he meets an angel and goes on a flying Nimbus ride, then falls into hell for a couple minutes where he learns a valuable lesson about how being sad is bad and smiling more, even when everything objectively sucks, makes the world a brighter place. Literally, by making the golden marble in your soul glow, but also figuratively, because smiling at his mom means she's not mad when his dad has to stay late at work, which in turn allows him to work harder and make more money, and when she spends that money, that makes the shopkeepers happy too. It's definitely a strange and bad story devoid of logic and helpful advice, but no more so than any half-baked after-school special. And because all its supernatural elements are framed as a dream, if you don't know who made it and you're not familiar with the sun iconography and feelings-based cosmology of happy science, it's easy enough to mistake for generic Christian fluff with some weird visual metaphors. The rest of these films, though, are unmistakable in what they are. Hermes Winds of Love opens on a very 90s CGI space shuttle for no apparent reason, with the narrator telling us in no uncertain terms that what we're about to see is 100% factually accurate, real ancient Greek history. Then about 30 seconds after that, we see a pegasus chasing a golden feather through a sea of clouds and Buddha lotuses. The feather falls down to earth, passing by some actually gorgeous animation and backgrounds, the cult clearly paid Toei a lot for this, before it reaches an old man under a tree, who immediately leaps up and starts rattling off prophecies about how the future king of Greece is about to be born right here on Citia. Then the wind carries that feather up the hill to the palace, where it flies off screen and presumably up the queen's coochie to make that happen. And the resulting child's name is Hermes, who was a real guy, actually, and not a god on Mount Olympus. For some reason, that one random old guy's rambling is deemed important enough to reach the ears of the evil tyrant King Minos, or possibly Minos. They pronounce it literally every possible way in this dub, and that's a running theme with these movies. But he's just like, nah, city is too small to beat me. Cut to 26 years later, though, and we see this Hermes fella's gotten pretty good at riding horses and knocking other people off of their horses, so Minos and his massive, technologically advanced army might want to double-think that. We then learn, through the extremely organic and seamless exposition delivery system of two children running around town discussing what woman could possibly be beautiful enough to bang their prince, that there's a gorgeous princess named Aphrodite locked up in a castle on Lindos. The film then introduces her through a skinny dipping shot, cause religious propaganda or not, anime's gonna anime. And then, Hermes begins stalking her. Like, he visits her window 12 times in six months by rowboat, despite her refusing to talk to him and actively hiding from him every time he shows up. But don't worry, it, it's not really stalking, because he's got a really strong feeling that he and this woman he's never talked to are meant to be together. Which they are! And not just in this life. They'll be married again in the future when they're reincarnated as Ryuho Okawa and his wife, Kyoko Okawa. Uh, spoilers for the movie's post credit scene, I guess. 
The divinity and predestined love of this couple is one of the core beliefs of Happy Science and one of the core elements of this film's narrative, so it sure would be awkward if they ever got divorced in 2011, and then Kyoko was excommunicated from Happy Science for revealing to the press that despite their claims of over 10 million members worldwide, the real number is closer to 30,000, and then their son also disowned him and started publicly bashing the cult. He's got a YouTube channel, by the way. Uh, spoilers for real life after this movie came out, I guess. Anyway, sometime in the last 26 years, that one thing King Minos is actually known for happened, and after locking his mutant bull son and wife in the labyrinth of Gnosis, he becomes the most evil thing happy science thinks there is an atheist. Also, he started wearing a bullhead luchador mask and making his soldiers use cow print shields, just really committing to the bit, you know. As a result, Minos is also in the market for a new wife, and he's got his eye on Aphrodite, but after window shopping way too many times, like it really kills the pacing of the movie, Hermes does finally decide to commit in an embarrassingly cringy musical number. <laughs> Which is followed a month later with a daring, action-packed rescue, where the army of Rhodes nearly catches our heroes with their high-speed triremes, but then, just in time, a mystical golden fart cloud catches their sails and carries them away. Could that be the wind of love? The news of this, of course, enrages King Minos. I will send my troops to Sidia and kill every man, woman, and child! Which would be super exciting and dramatic if he actually remembered to do that, or anything at all before Hermes rolls up with an army to kill him in like 20 minutes. Instead, on a peaceful day in Sidia, Hermes takes his new wife on a stroll up a hill where they happen to meet those kids from before, looking like they just popped out of the Akira elderly child labs. Suddenly, though, the children disappear, storm clouds kick up, and out of the maelstrom emerges Mufasa. Sorry, that's Ophelus, the creator god of Greek mythology that Happy Science made up, who tells Hermes that it's his destiny to unite Greece, starting with the defeat of Minos. To facilitate this and beat the stated 50 to 1 odds against his army, Hermes forges an alliance with Theseus, who's then sent to Knossos undercover as a hostage to recruit the help of Minos's quote, sane and religious daughter, Ariadne. He takes a thread from Ariadne and does the thing Theseus does down in the labyrinth, freeing the other hostages and killing an admittedly pretty sick-looking minotaur in a very rushed and unsatisfying fight scene. Then, with the other hostages, he starts burning down the palace while Minos is charging out to meet Hermes' army for a very rushed and unsatisfying battle. The palace! The entire palace is on fire! What are we Shut going up, to do? Shut up, you fool! All troops, head back to the palace now! Turning around opens him up for an ambush from the woods, defeating most of his army. Then Minos himself dies in a hilariously stupid sword fight back at the palace. At which point, there is still an hour left in the movie somehow. To say it loses the plot from here would be an understatement. Hermes spends some more time up on that hill, learning to meditate and literally watching grass grow under the instruction of Ophelus, which gives him some kind of epiphany about the sun or life cycles or something. It's a scene as pretty as it is vapid and mind-numbing. As a reward for his efforts, Ophelus reveals to Hermes that they are actually one and the same, both incarnations of the great god El Cantare. He then bestows upon himself, I guess, a mystic staff with boundless spiritual powers like being a dousing rod and a fish finder and that's about all we see it used for in the movie. It apparently has zero utility in rescuing Aphrodite's still-kidnapped blind mom, which Hermes instead does using good old-fashioned violence. In retaliation, the army of Lindos catapults the ever-loving shit out of Sidia, which Hermes and everyone there kind of just takes in stride after burning their ships. After the battle, he moves the capital of his growing kingdom to a port town to start a new trade alliance that completely reshapes the political landscape 
landscape of Greece, but that's not nearly as important to the story of this movie as the fact that his wife can't conceive, apparently, which is a choice for the goddess of fertility. Aphrodite goes off to a pond to cry about it, lamenting that her husband, nay, her whole nation would be better off if he just screwed some random hussy behind her back. And to reward her selfless love, the goddess of love, who I guess isn't her, shows up and shoots Aphrodite with a baby-making arrow. And she tells her to name their son Eros, which isn't what Hermes and Aphrodite's child was called, but I guess this right-wing cult didn't want to deal with all the implications that come with Hermaphroditus. Once the kid's born, Hermes goes to pray at the Temple of Ophelis, where those horror children show up once again to reveal that they are actually Agape and Pan, a pair of fairies who present him with a pair of sandals. You know the ones, with the wings. They're a bit small, but they stretch, and after putting them on, Hermes realizes that instead of flying, they grant him the power of astral projection, which first takes him out into space, and then, uh, down? To heaven, which is a field of flowers. There we get to learn some interesting this-is-what-scientologists-actually-believe type happy science lore, like how every flower contains a fairy that decides when it'll bloom and what color it'll be. Or how there used to be mermaids on Earth, but they all got sad and went away because humans don't think about how pretty the ocean is enough. Also, there's a magic lake full of fireworks somehow, and also fish that sing at you to smile more, which kinda sounds like hell. But then Hermes goes to actual hell, where all the bad men get turned into scary-faced trees, and their branches get broken off by demons to cook all the bad women and eat them. But where, you ask, do those demons come from? The baddest guys turn into those, and of course Minos, being the baddest bad guy there ever was, has turned into an ultra demon. And he's about to kill Aphrodite back on Earth by making the sky overcast because something something power of darkness, so they have to fight right now. And it is epically okay. Nothing you haven't seen before in a million other anime. Also, apparently the all-powerful staff isn't useful for fighting demons either, so so, so much for that setup. At least the trash talk's decent, though. <sighs> you are such a bad loser, Hermes. Right when he's on the ropes and the earth on the verge of doom, Hermes realizes, oh right, I'm God actually, and an army of angels descends from the sky in golden space boats to pump Ganon full of light arrows, saving the day, which teaches us the valuable lesson that God is invincible, and all you have to do to defeat evil is believe, and most importantly, be happy. The film ends with Hermes giving a big clifftop speech about love to his wife, with some shot choices that are extra funny when you remember what's going to happen to this relationship in 4,311 years. Once the wind stops blowing, it ceases to exist. Just like when one person stops loving another, love also dies. That said, Okawa's new wife, Shiho, is apparently an earthly incarnation of the Earth herself, Gaia, and any dude who's sexing up the entire planet is obviously winning so hard that no amount of mockery could ever possibly hurt him. Not that that'll stop me from trying. On to the next movie! Oh, and, uh, fair warning, that was probably the least insane one of these. The second movie, Laws of the Sun, isn't really a movie at all, so much as a condensed animated cult gospel outlining the true history of the universe and human civilization in its entirety. A timeline that's wrong from literally the first femtosecond of time, as it says the Big Bang happened 40 billion years ago, which is approximately 27 and a half billion too early. Extra time that they don't even do anything with, since nothing happens after that until the eternal Buddha decides to start experimenting with organic life on Venus, which happened 5.5 billion years ago, or 1 billion years before our solar system even existed. Which I only bring up because happy science claims to be a fusion of religion and science, and how hard is it to double-check your fake timeline against an encyclopedia, you lazy hack? 
Anyway, after spending two billion years making cool-looking anime critters, El Miore decided it was time for humans to happen, and so began a great spacefaring Venusian civilization that lasted the next billion years. Unfortunately, that civilization was just so loving and harmonious that they couldn't evolve anymore, and so the loving, harmonious, eternal Buddha blew them all up with volcanoes and sent their ghosts to oversee evolution from scratch on Earth. Then, 2.1 billion years after that, or 400 million years ago, El Miore changed his name to El Cantare and brought a bunch more of the Venus ghosts to Earth to become humans again. Which beats actual science's earliest estimates of human presence on Earth by a cool 300,700,000 years. Once our population reached 770 million, El Cantare decided to invite humanoid aliens to Earth to learn from us. Because the planet had a bit of a dinosaur infestation going on at the time, the first race invited was a warlike species of cat people with laser guns and hoverboards, watched over by the three great ninth dimensional alien spirits, Jesus, Confucius, and Moses. But after they dealt with that pest problem, it turned out the not Katarl Katarl were kinda assholes. And so, 270 million years ago, that would be 40 million years before the first known dinosaur fossil, El Cantare invited a new wave of a billion nicer space immigrants, this time from Orion. And with them came three more great ninth dimensional spirits, Hinduism's first man Manu, the future Buddha Maitreya, and Sir Isaac Newton. Just to be clear, I am quoting this movie almost verbatim right now. 140 million years after that, two billion more aliens came here from Pegasus, bringing with them two more great spirits, Zeus and Zoroaster. By this time, the human spirit group numbered 40 billion, with aliens accounting for just 10% of Earth's population, so to help them multiply, the great spirits built a Pytron, which is apparently a thing that clones souls or aliens or something, it's not entirely clear. Unfortunately, the alien clones started doing sex and drugs and stuff, which corrupted their souls and dragged them down to the bottom layer of the spirit world, turning it into hell. Then, 120 million years ago, when a bunch of angels murked one of those cat boys I was talking about for apparently the crime of having a harem, he led a rebellion in hell, making everything worse. Let me reiterate that, in case you missed it. In happy science, the devil is an alien cat boy. Your religion ain't got shit. Under his influence, dark clouds covered the lower spirit realm, blotting out all light from the eternal Buddha. And so, because ghosts are solar-powered, apparently, the spirits of hell headed up to Earth to sap the energy of people with bad attitudes and possess them which only filled hell up with even more evil spirits, creating a sort of feedback loop of eternal damnation. The consciousness of Earth eventually put a stop to Catboy Satan's machinations with some mild apocalypses, but then El Cantare thought of a better, less murdery way to purge the land of evil by filling human hearts with love and wisdom, available in book form for a nominal fee. It's here that we start getting into the more recent history of human civilization, and the movie really starts going all ancient aliens on us. The first place El Cantare decided to spread his light to was the fabled lost continent of Mu, located near present-day Indonesia, which was actually called Moa when humans first settled there 20,000 years ago, but renamed after El Cantare's incarnation, King Lamu 17,000 years ago. Lamu, you see, realizing that primitive sun worship was no longer enough to stop his people from pushing old men over and being ungrateful to nurses, taught them about God, and instantly everyone was happy and the nation prosperous. But it couldn't last. After Lamu died, slowly but surely, people started being dicks again, and eventually those dicks got so girthy they sunk the whole dang continent. Some people of Mu sailed nearby to found the civilizations of China, Vietnam, and Japan, while others sailed far eastward to Atlantis, and I probably don't have to tell you how that turned out. Though before Atlantis did the Atlantis thing, El Cantare did visit them as Thoth, 
bringing their art, culture, and technology to new heights even beyond those of Mu. When Atlantis finally did do the thing around 10,000 years ago, its people once again spread out, this time to Egypt, Greece, and Rome, forming the basis of Western civilization, while others flew even further west to the Andes Mountains, where they became the Inca. Now, in reality, the Incan Empire was extremely recent, only existing in the 14th and 15th centuries CE, and the earliest Andean civilization, the Corral, founded its first city in 3500 BC, but I'll let all that slide because this sets up easily the funniest part of the movie. See, at some point, the Incan people got tricked by a cabal of evil, shape-shifting criminal space lizards called the Reptalians into worshipping them as gods and sacrificing virgins to them as snacks, which was only the first stage in an elaborate plan to exploit a loophole in the universal code of planetary non-interference and... Actually, I'm just gonna let the movie explain this part so you don't think I'm exaggerating. They then intended to have their compatriots immigrate to Earth so they could control the planet before the space police interfered. Luckily, the space police weren't needed because El Cantare showed up once again, this time as Rient Arl Crowd, a totally made up ancient Incan king, just in the nick of time to save some random girl from getting eaten. Then he defeated the high priest's feelings based argument that. Those guys had to be gods because they could fly in a giant spaceship with the facts and logic of look at this balloon though, before teaching the Incans that the secret to stopping malicious aliens from invading Earth is, again, no joke, the power of love. Later, in 4500 BCE, 1200 years before Greece was founded, El Cantare manifested again as Ophelus, the made-up founding god of Greece, and you already know how that story goes. Then, in 500 BCE, the only remotely accurate date on this timeline, he manifested one last time in India as Siddhartha Gautama, the founder of Buddhism. The film then briefly recounts the actual Buddhist legend of how he attained enlightenment under the Bodhi tree, embellishing it only ever so slightly with a big dumb anime fight against a horde of demons. Then it jumps forward 40 years to the equally famous Buddhist story of that time Buddha gathered all his followers to tell them that everything happy science believes is true, actually, and he's gonna come back in Japan 2500 years from now as a super special Space Buddha more powerful than all his previous incarnations combined. Because Japan, you see, is where the Eastern and Western civilizations that he founded finally intersect, and that has never happened in any other culture or country ever. And oh golly gosh gee whiz, would you look at that! Japan is here, outside the theater where you're watching this movie! And 2,600 years later is now! That Super Space Buddha guy's already here, and right now the reincarnations of his followers are wandering around Tokyo, recognizing each other and glowing and stuff. Which is the note the movie ends on. And Happy Science's third film, The Golden Laws, picks up literally right where it leaves off, before zooming out into deep space where some Star Wars text promises to reveal the will of the primordial Buddha hidden within time. Then we zoom back to Earth, now 500 years in the future, in the land of New Atlantis, which is kind of like naming your cruise ship Titanic 2, but some idiot Australian billionaire is apparently already doing that, so I guess it's not too implausible. In the grand scheme of things, I think the bigger and more obvious mistake is just starting this movie with footage from the last one, because it really highlights how flat and garish these early digi-paint visuals and CGI backdrops are compared to the lush, hand-painted look of the older movies. Say what you will about those, I know I just did, but at least they had solid art direction that made both the historical locations and the made-up lands of Venus, Mu, and Atlantis feel distinct and authentic. This just looks like literally any early 2000s sci-fi anime. But The Golden Laws does make up for that by being substantially more entertaining, 
and deranged than either of its prequels. Like, it's basically Kingdom Hearts, only replace the Disney fairy tales with well-known stories about famous historical religious figures, and all the heartless stuff that connects it is now Super Space Buddha time travel stuff. Our obligatory plucky teen hero Satoru is studying to be a religious leader at Happy Science University Middle School, based on a real boarding school where you can really send your real children to be isolated and indoctrinated for a whole lot of real money, and as part of a research project, he picks up a copy of The Golden Laws to read. Also a real thing that real money can get you, of course, along with over 2,800 other books written by Okawa, by which I mean most of them were just transcribed from live lectures, such as The Truth of Nanking and Comfort Women Issues. Fucking yikes. What real money can't get, yet, is a time machine, but luckily one of those crash lands in Satoru's backyard, carrying with it a 15-year-old girl named Alyssa who really wanted to meet him specifically when he was 15 because he's some unspecified kind of celebrity in her time, the 30th century. Yahoo! Also, they're very obviously related, but the film treats that like it's a big twist. The cops quickly show up to investigate what they must think is an illegally parked spaceship, and of course being cops, they immediately whip their guns out for that. So Alyssa's gotta get away fast, but she conveniently needs an antique 26th century iPad to get her time machine moving again, which Satoru holds hostage until she agrees to take him with her to visit 21st century Japan. You know, cause Super Space Buddha lives there. But no sooner are they off than a mysterious malfunction causes their machine to careen uncontrollably through all the wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey stuff, shooting them out over ancient Japan instead. Then they warp to ancient Egypt, where they inspire a guy to chisel a hieroglyph that History Channel hosts will no doubt salivate over millennia later. Next, it's off to the Nazca Lines, and finally to Babylon, where they spook the shit out of Ezekiel with a pillar of fire in the clouds. After that, Alyssa finally gets the controls working, and they head at last to modern Tokyo Bay, where they're immediately greeted by God. Godzilla, that is. Okay, it actually turns out to be a generic sea serpent, but whoever made that joke with the music, I see you and I love you. It also turns out that their readout was wrong, and this serpent happens to be in the seas of ancient Greece, not Tokyo, and you know what that means. It's Hermes time, baby! After blasting the monster with a laser from the staff of Kelyukeon, hey, it does a third thing. He uses his swollen arms to launch a golden arrow straight into its forehead, which doesn't kill it, but does act as a convenient lightning rod for the fourth thing that staff can do. After that, they pull the kids up on deck, where Hermes tells Satoru to continue his journey through time so he can find his golden treasure. Then he summons the time machine for them with his staff, which, wow, that's five things, and the movie's only getting warmed up. Next, they're off to ancient Egypt again, this time circa 1200 BCE, where they immediately break the nose off the Sphinx because the screenwriter was running on time travel movie autopilot, I guess. But there's no time to dwell on that cliché. We got places to be, namely the Red Sea, where Moses and the Israelites are moseying through the whole Exodus thing. Using the telepathy radio on their invisible time machine, Alyssa warns him about the approaching Egyptian army, then uses the ship's built-in hologram projector to hold them off with some non-lethal pillars of fire, which buys Moses just enough time to do the thing. After watching the thing, the kids make another jump, but the golden fart comes back to knock them out of the time stream and into India 500 BCE, just in time to meet Siddhartha Gautama, the Shakyamuni Buddha and, more importantly, to bear witness to absolute comic gold. See, the Buddha story that they've decided to Kingdom Hearts into this one is the parallel of Devadatta, 
a jealous cousin of the Buddha who tried to murder him and take over his Sangha at the behest of King Ajatashatru. And the way the film chooses to present that spiritually significant story is basically like a Roadrunner cartoon. Admittedly, the original tale's attempted murder methods, death by giant boulder and elephant stampede, do sort of lend themselves to that interpretation, but it's an odd choice, if intended, to say the least, as is turning Devadatta into a scenery-gobbling Yu-Gi-Oh villain. Why? Why? Why would the rock break into pieces? <sighs> <sighs> Don't think you can get away from me. I won't give up. Not that I'm complaining. Every line out of this dude's mouth is pure gold. But the best part comes after the kids blow up the boulder with a laser and then the elephant rampage scheme also fails when Devadatta comes up with a new anime original plan to kill the Buddha. This will kill even an elephant in a second. I'll use this. A deadly poison. You sure you don't want to, like, put a glove on first, buddy? Or maybe use a finger you don't chew habitually? If you deeply repent, you can always start fresh. <laughs> yep, saw that coming. Seeing the Buddha be so chill about all this makes the evil king finally realize that he's legit, and instantly all the boils he had on his face on account of being evil clear up. All of a sudden, the time machine sleep mode alarm starts ringing and the kids have to go, but they've been captured by the guards! Oh no! Luckily, Buddha remembers them helping Hermes later in the movie and vouches for them so they can go. And back aboard the ship, we get some of the greatest dialogue I've ever heard in anything. Say, does your golden book have any information on how to fix a time machine? It might. I haven't read the whole thing. Find it? Well, what does it say? The time machine will be created in the 30th century in the new Atlantean civilization. Bingo! Unfortunately, the book only goes on to detail how time travel will be outlawed shortly thereafter due to a tragic time accident, but movie? You came this close to selling me a time machine manual. From there, the kids are off to Rome in 33 CE to watch Jesus get crucified, which plays out mostly like your typical somber American passion play, with occasional injections of batshit anime insanity, like Alyssa explaining that they're the only ones who can see the angels picking up Jesus because their time machine's view screen can see into the fourth dimension where the spirit realm is. Which doesn't explain how later, when they're out of the ship for the resurrection, they can still see the golden clouds surrounding Jesus, and also Hermes Mufasaing his way out of those clouds to shine a spotlight on Jesus with his staff. We got a sixth thing! This movie literally tripled the things from the last one! Back in the time machine, once again, we suddenly learn that it's almost out of juice and only has five leaps left, so the kids have to hurry to the present. But of course, another golden fart comes along to knock them into the 6th century, where they see Zhi Yi, a prominent Chinese Buddhist scholar, talking to Aphrodite as the Bodhisattva of Wisdom, followed by Buddha himself which is mostly just an excuse for the film to dip into a long, boring sermon about how if you think too many horny thoughts, horny ghosts from hell will possess you and use your body to get their ghost rocks off. By the same spiritual mechanic, though, the sermon promises, the more time you spend thinking about Buddha and how awesome he is, the closer your mind will drift toward enlightenment. Which becomes more than a little insidious when you remember who Buddha is in this scenario. In Happy Science's worldview, any negative thought, especially one about El Cantare, puts you on the precipice of damnation. Satoru doesn't think about that, though. Instead, he gets inspired to go back in time one last time to Greece so that he can find that treasure Hermes was talking about. And despite the danger that their still malfunctioning time ship might strand them then, Alyssa agrees. 
On the way, the time sea gets all stormy, and they're almost sucked into a time whirlpool, but Satoru prays to Hermes, and a golden laser guides them out of danger and into the sky above some kind of ancient Greek gamer gathering with RGB lighting. The leader of those gamers is a self-proclaimed god named Prometheus, obviously the bad kind of self-proclaimed god, who has red skin and hair made of fire. Hermes is there too, lecturing him about how a real god strives to fill people's hearts with love by suing and literally demonizing his own son, for example. But Prometheus is like, nah, granting wishes is better, which is objectively true. Then he encircles Hermes in hilarious CGI fire, and when the kids try to stop him with the wind from their invisible time ship, demonstrates he can see into the fourth dimension by blasting them out of the sky in two clean shots. Hermes seems to be on the ropes, but then he remembers his trusty astral projection toe sandals, which he uses to visit the king of the sea dragons. Because sea dragons are super duper religious, actually, and also that earlier attack was just a mistake. Meanwhile, back at the gamer drome, Satoru tries to stop Prometheus from burning Hermes' body and is completely useless in doing so. So Alyssa has no choice but to use her secret weapon, a derpy looking holographic lion, which is marginally less useless. And together they buy just enough time for a storm to start as the sea dragons attack in glory. Glorious rainbow CGI, and riding atop their king comes Hermes, who hurls lightning at Prometheus like BAM! POW! ZAP! And when the clouds clear, his body is still there, unharmed and praying in a shimmering ray of light. Prometheus claims it's just some kind of trick, but then his disciples turn on him, revealing that actually it is he who was the Scooby-Doo villain all along, and they were lighting all the fires in secret. He never had any powers to begin with. So, like, how'd he shoot down the invisible time ship then? Did he just get extremely lucky? Because you've already established that there are evil aliens with spiritual powers who pretend to be gods, and he's got, like, red skin and stuff. I'm just saying, there's definitely a cleaner way to resolve that. After one more boring, choppily animated sermon from Hermes, guess the budget blew out with that storm, the kids get back in the ship only to discover that, oh no, the crash drained their battery and they have just one time jump left now, which they decide to take back to 26th century New Atlantis because if Satoru doesn't return home, Alyssa might never be born. And they can't just fix the time machine and take him back after that because... This sadly also means that they can't meet Super Space Buddha in the 21st century, but that's okay because El Cantare was right behind them in the fourth dimension all along, delting and presumably smelting all them golden farts. For you see, the true nature of time they promised to reveal at the start is that it's God's river of love. The time machine gets back literally two seconds after the confused cops leave, and Alyssa's pretty bummed about never being able to see her family or friends again, because the only way to recharge the ship is with a special meteor from Pleiades. Then, like three seconds later, her mom and dad show up, having spent the year since she disappeared building a new time machine, but acting like they just saw her five minutes ago. Satoru finally learns that she's his great-great-great-great-granddaughter, which bums him out because he really wanted to tap that. Anime's gonna anime. But a few seconds later, he's elated to learn that he'll one day become the great reverend priest Satoru. Which isn't why Alyssa went back originally. She just stole the time machine because she wanted to meet someone in her family who had really good grades in middle school? So that must mean they changed the past after all. Which is super dumb because everything else in the movie implied that time is deterministic and they were always destined to make this trip. That's the whole point of the overused breaking the Sphinx's nose gag. I'm starting to think Okawa might be as much of a hack fraud science fiction author as he is a hack fraud in general. But of course, we're only just getting started. And I'll warn you now, if the seven digit timestamp on this thing didn't warn you already, the first three happy science movies did nothing to prepare me for the howling vortex of madness that is the next three happy science movies. I'm Helen.
Helen Keller. What? With their third film, The Golden Laws, they finally realized that most people avoid explicit edutainment, actually, and started moving toward more conventional and marketable plot and character-driven storytelling. This has only freed them to make their anime even goofier and substantially less hinged. The Laws of Eternity is another transitional fossil in this evolutionary process. It has twice as many principal characters, and some of them even follow the barest traces of an arc, but its basic plot is identical to that of the Golden Laws. Some kids take a novel, spirit-based invention on a tour through happy science scripture. Only instead of happy history, we're learning happy cosmology this time, and instead of a time machine, we're using Thomas Edison's spirit phone. History's most overrated inventor really did try to build a ghost communicator in his later days, though he never called it a phone, per se. His real hypothesis was that a sensitive enough pressure gauge could detect trace human personality in the atmosphere and read that out somehow. But this movie couldn't even put the Edison Museum in the right state, and the laws of the sun just blind hucked a dart at the bathroom door next to the board to peg the Incan Empire as 7,000 years old. So by happy science standards, this is actually pretty good research. And that's not even the film's only fun Edison fact. When Edison invented the gramophone, the first song he recorded was Mary Had a Little Lamb. Sing it together. Wait, th did I say fun? I meant horrifying. I'm not gonna lie, I heard that behind me in a spooky video game. I would pee. It's enough to spook the film's heroes, a trio of Japanese tourists from Kainan High School Science Club, into leaving for lunch early. Unfortunately, even on the new iPhone hologram, Apple Maps is still Apple Maps, and Roberto ends up leading Patrick and Ryuta down a shady New York alley instead, where they're swiftly ambushed by a racist caricature. Though not one we typically see in that biome. The old shaman lady says she has a message for the kids from Edison in the spirit world, so they follow her back to her hut, somewhere in New Mexico apparently, where she channels his spirit using the traditional Native American ceremony of holding a feather and vibrating. I am Edison. I have a message for you. There is a new invention. You must spirit what? world. She's just making it up. That is some hilarious fake seance dialogue any way you slice it, but it's extra funny when you know that Ryuho Okawa talks pretty much exactly like that in his spirit interviews. I love uh, my fellow citizen. God, where? What happened to me? Come on! The old lady falls over and Ryuta runs to help her, but then their fingers touch instead, E.T. style, and the blueprints for the spirit phone come flooding into his mind all at once. Also, she fucking dies and no one cares. Are you okay, Ruta? Okay, I'm goofing you. She's actually fine, the dub just really oversells her collapsing. But that's not the only line where the tone is a bit... off. I just don't want to give up before I even give it a try. Huh. Well, that's what I like about you. You're different from other smart guys. You really make me want to do something for you. Hmm? Perhaps sensing those impending implications, the film's chaste religious love interest, Yuko, chooses this moment to knock on the lab window. And recalling that the old lady mentioned they'd need someone else's help to build the spirit phone, Roberto reasons that because Yuko goes to a religious school and thus knows about the spirit world, she's got to be the one. As further evidence of this, she coincidentally read about the spirit phone on Wikipedia last night. Also, she bumped into Patrick on the way over here, who's being all tsundere about helping with the ghost phone because he's the film's obligatory skeptic character, but ultimately he decides to help too, just to prove that ghosts don't exist, b, -b baka One montage and a bout of brain-dead technobabble later and the phone is done, and actually looks pretty decent for a CGI model from 2006. It doesn't appear to work at first, but Yuko realizes that's just because these silly science boys forgot the most essential step of the boot-up process. Prayer! 
Must run on Windows me. And with El Cantare's blessing, they finally get a signal. Though my pants wish they hadn't. Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, little lamb. Thomas Edison greets our hero by his full name, Ryuta Hoshikawa. I see what you did there, movie. Then begins ominously explaining that he contacted them over some trouble before the connection even more ominously cuts out halfway through a sentence. Patrick and Roberto freak out while Ryuta and Yoko try the prey phone again, and while they can't get a hold of Edison, a spirit named God Eagle, the highest shaman of the ancient Incan civilization that Ryuho Okawa made up, does answer and offers to be their guide to the other side. Yuko conveniently learned how to astral project at religious school, too, so after about 10 seconds of meditation, everyone's out of their bodies and up in the clouds, where they find a mysterious stone gateway that leads to an ever-shifting city full of business ghosts who don't seem to realize they're dead yet. That's pretty metal, actually. Patrick starts freaking out again about the whole freaky situation, which is understandable, but then he calls Roberto Chubface, which is just uncalled for. And the damnation mechanics of the Happy Science Afterlife, if you're in a bad mood ever, you go straight to hell. Seriously, that's how it works. Don't allow for the he started it defense, so after a couple seconds of bickering, a sinkhole opens up to swallow up the both of them. Luckily, God Eagle swoops in at the last second to save the day and tell us where we are. Where are we? In the fourth dimensional posthumous realm where people who have just died come and experience the surprise that they are spiritual beings. So it's ghost orientation, basically. But the kids skipped ghost reception, so God Eagle takes them back there to formally start their tour. On the bank of the River Styx, they learn that all souls have these ghost umbilical cords sticking out of their heads that fall off 24 hours after death. Also, across the river lies a hill of golden flowers, atop which sits a massive movie theater multiplex, where every deceased soul in existence is forced to sit and watch a movie of their entire life, including all of their private thoughts as commentary, in front of their entire dead family. No, we ain't made it to hell yet. This is still only check-in. After the movie, your family votes on whether or not you go to hell, and if you're really lucky and earn some Americlaps from the audience, you might even get an express pass to the upper tiers of heaven. Or you could just think some happy thoughts to get there, like the kids do. So, is this heaven? This is the fifth dimension, realm of the good. Hmm? It is a part of heaven. Happy Science Heaven is actually divided into several realms, each of which houses a different caliber of soul. For instance, the soul prerequisite to make it to these lush green fields full of bizarrely oversized vegetables is apparently to say thank you a lot all the time for literally everything to literally everyone. Beyond that lies the sixth dimension, the realm of light, where advanced souls who've become leaders in their respective fields come to study forever, inspired by the divine light of the eternal Buddha. Appropriately, its door only opens to those with powerful dreams. No horny dreams, though. Bad Roberto. After that clarification, all the kids do make it through, and Roberto and Patrick even get to see visions of their future scientific achievements, respectively a spirit energy-based generator and a device that detects impending illnesses at the soul level before they can start hitting your body. And the next dimension up's an even more exclusive club. The seventh dimension, Bodhisattva Realm, lies beyond the narrow gate which only those with the prerequisites of an angel can pass through. Obviously, Patrick's way too much of a dick for that, and Roberto's too... Uh, look, we, we've seen enough of these movies at this point to make an educated guess as to why Roberto's not getting into the VIP section of heaven. But God Eagle still makes them all go through the same test anyway, helping ten old and sick people through rehab in a hospital-esque pocket dimension. One monotonous montage later, Ryuta and Yuko both, of course, get the go-ahead, but Patrick gets left behind because he complained about being tired once in his head, and Roberto had a thought about how he deserves some gratitude for helping those people, so sin of pride, he's out too. 
And after telling them this, God Eagle just abandons the pair of them. I'm sure that's not going to cause problems later. On the other side, Ryuta stumbles into a spirit lab full of spirit scientists and business guys working on spirit stuff, one of whom compliments him on his spirit phone. After a moment, he realizes that guy is Konosuke Matsushita, the founder of Panasonic, who introduces him to Sakichi Toyota and a bunch of other, quote, people who contributed to building Japan's prosperity. Apparently, in happy science, Bodhisattva means billionaire. Suddenly, all the Edison worship is starting to make a bit more sense. Speak of the angel and he shall appear. You never thought angels wore business suits and working clothes, did you? Finally, we meet Ryuta Hoshikawa. Mr. Edison. Just a side note, Edison was a brunette. It's not clear why they made him blonde and blue-eyed here. Again, again though, we can make an educated guess. It's probably the same reason they did it to Helen Keller and Speak of the Angel, it's finally time for her to appear before Yuko and explain exactly what her deal is. Are you uncomfortable seeing a talkative Helen who can see and hear Yuko? Uh, no. That was all planned before I was born. Angels sometimes do things like that. <sighs> Yuko, you and I have always been friends, you know. Friends? Turns out she's not the only angel friend Yuko forgot about. Honorable Ms. Nightingale. Lawrence Nightingale? Back at the gate, Patrick's starting to get predictably salty about being left behind by all his friends, and of course the impressionable young Roberto gets sucked into that too. Ugh, we went through all that trouble, and now we can't even meet Edison. Then they both get sucked into it, it being hell where a mysterious mustachioed gentleman appears and offers to help them find their way out, though subtle clues suggest that it might be a trap. Back at the lab, Edison informs Ryuta that he's actually from the eighth dimension, Tathagata realm, but he comes down to slum it with the bodhisattvas sometimes when he's feeling bored. After explaining the principles of reincarnation, he reveals it wasn't him who was in trouble at all, but rather science itself, due to scientists focusing on the material world and ignoring the new frontier of the spirit world. He wants Ryuta to fix that. Suddenly, corporate whistle music kicks up, and the scene turns into a weird TED talk about how spirit technology can help mankind reach the stars and harness limitless energy and stuff. Like, is, they're really trying to sell this technology to that th they made up in their, in their cartoon movie. It, it's weird. It's really weird. At the same time, Florence Nightingale's going off on her own tangent about how if everyone only knew about reincarnation, we'd have world peace because everyone would realize that they already know everyone else and they don't want to kill people they already know. Then she details some of the ways that angels go down to Earth to help people, and Mother Teresa arrives to elaborate that some angels even go down to hell to try to save souls down there. Mr. Edison, you are the god of science, the greatest scientist of all humankind. No, that's not true. The greatest scientist on Earth would actually be none other than Thoth. Thoth? around 12,000 years ago in Atlantis. Edison lists off all of El Cantare's incarnations, which I already went over in the last video, and explains that they can all be found in the holiest of spiritual planes, the ninth dimension, Cosmic Realm. However, he tells Ryuta he can't go there because it'd be the spiritual equivalent of diving straight into the sun. He does, however, get to take a spirit elevator up to the eighth dimension. This is actually the greatest invention of the spirit world. And it's made by yours truly. Okay, guess it wasn't pride that kept Roberto out of here. Must have been something else. Ryuta heads up in the elevator and pops out to grab Yuko right when her angel friends are telling her that actually she reincarnated with the man she's destined to marry. Ooh, subtle. Together, they ascend to the higher realm, where they're greeted by a man, and that man is Albert Einstein. 
who explains that all 500-ish of the beings in this realm have achieved enlightenment and transcended their mortal forms. Thus, there's actually infinity people up there, but also zero. He then demonstrates, using a goldfish, that time is an illusion here, too, so I guess that giant hourglass is just ornamental. Furthermore, he announces plans to reincarnate in the 30th century and build a time machine, meaning he's also Arissa's dad. This conversation raises a lot of questions, but there's no time to answer them because the film just realized it's been 50 minutes since it had a plot. God Eagle pops in to announce that Patrick and Roberto have been captured by demons, and Yuko and Ryuta have to take the elevator down to save them. On the way, they pass through the Hell of Strife, an eternally burning city surrounded by volcanoes that's home to combative and cruel souls. Next is the Hell of the Inescapable Pit, an office complex where demons force people to work really long shifts at really cramped desks as a punishment for those who envied happy and successful people and tried to bring them down. In other words, Ryuho Okawa built a special hell just for the haters. After that is the Hell of the Bloody Pond, wherein those obsessed with the opposite sex get trapped in a massive, endless blood orgy until they realize how nasty they are. Sounds nice. The elevator then passes a base camp for all the angels Mother Teresa mentioned to delve into hell to save people, before finally arriving in a barren, rocky valley deep in the realm of demons, where their friends are tied up in the gnarled branches of a massive, evil-looking tree. And, of course, right as they arrive, they're greeted by the sinister mustache man, who's revealed to be the god-murdering philosopher himself, Friedrich Nietzsche. And he's brought a whole army of zombie Nazis with him. But he needs no violence to fulfill his master plan, which was to lure Ryuta here and turn him into an atheist. Many of your peers on Earth have awakened already. Freedom of religion also means the freedom of not believing in religion. I promise you, I did not add that music. Nietzsche argues that a life without God gives people more personal freedom, to which Ryuta retorts, Yeah, well if you're so smart, how come you're in hell then? The mighty light of his facts and logic is so bright that it instantly wakes Patrick and Roberto, blinds the zombie Nazis, and causes Nietzsche's to pound ground like an angry Dr. Eggman. But our heroes aren't out of the woods just yet. Because wherever you find zombie Nazis, it's only a matter of time until you run into zombie. Hitler! Nietzsche's, I told you! It's easier to use force! Force, in this case, refers to the giant CGI elephant monster Hitler brought with him, Behemoth. Sorry, Behemoth which engages in a big dumb anime fight with God Eagle, knocking a mountain onto the spirit elevator in the process. Eventually, God Eagle sacrifices himself to stop the beast, but even that only slows it down, prompting Nietzsche's to chant his catchphrase. <laughs> God is dead! God is dead! God is dead! But Ryuta ain't having it. The truth will not die. The truth never dies! At this point, he basically goes Super Saiyan, and the glow of his hair is so bright that it reaches all the way to heaven, calling down a giant angelic mecha to poke battle Behemoth on his behalf, which seems to turn the tide, but then Hissler busts out a Z move, and his heck Pokemon starts belching fire. Once again, though, Nietzsche's sprock too soon. By T-posing to assert dominance, Yuko summons a golden shield for the god Gundam, which in turn inspires Ryuta to summon a golden sword to protect her, and the light of them both is enough to blow away Behemoth and vaporize both Hisler and Nietzsche's. With the immediate threat vanquished, the kids hop on the mech to fly out of hell, but they're pursued by a host of demons who begin spilling out after them into the fifth dimension. Good thing, then, that there's a host of angels waiting on the other side, led by God Eagle, who's pulled an Avdol, and draws a cross in the air, followed by a star, to plug the hellhole up with a whole entire mountain. The film's not quite over yet, though. 
The spirit elevator shows up one last time, but this time it's an express ride to El Cantare's Cosmic Realm penthouse. Patrick and Roberto, humbled by their hell trip and reasonably sure they'd evaporate in the godson, both decline the offer, but Ryuta and Yuko head on up, and a schmaltzy musical number plays as they take a victory lap through the realms of heaven, soaring over unicorns and mermaids, and into a painting of Ryuho Okawa giving Adam and Eve a bowling trophy? Is that Da Vinci painting? They then pass Helen Keller and the angels, putting on a dance for Aphrodite. The Gundam flies up to see them off. And finally, they swing by Thomas Edison, who's putting finishing touches on some sort of angel energy drink. Also, apparently, his true mission all along was to get those two on the elevator. The reason for that becomes clear once they reach the ninth dimension, where they come face to face with the holiest beings in existence. Jesus Christ. Confucius. Newton. And, of course, above them all, we find all the different incarnations of El Cantare casting their holy radiance down on the globe of Earth. Then the Buddha himself delivers the film's big, big twist. Awaken, Thoth of today. Which I guessed, like, the second I heard Ryuta's name. Suddenly, he's standing on a beach in ancient Atlantis, admiring an Atlantean airship alongside his Atlantean wife, who's also Yuko. Now, the dialogue in this flashback is frustratingly inconsistent as to whether they actually are Thoth and his wife or just people who lived in Atlantis and happen to know them. But even if Ryuta's name is just a coincidence, it won't be long before Ryuho Okawa actually goes full self-insert on us. After his vision, Ryuta vows to go back down to Earth and prove the truth that he just learned in the spirit world by living in a proper way. Then everyone wakes back up in their bodies. He has a vision of growing up to win the Nobel Prize and marry Yuko. And finally, they go on a long walk out to a field in the middle of nowhere so they can stand there and watch the credits roll. I hope I've demonstrated, if through nothing else than the sheer girth of the roast you just heard, that The Laws of Eternity is substantially sillier than any of the already kooky cult movies to come before it. The movies that come after it, on the other hand, only get weirder. So, uh, the thing about the rebirth of Buddha... Okay, it's a couple things, actually. First off, the main plot of this movie... Holy shit, the cojones on this cult. Right, so in this movie, there's a new religion whose leader claims to be the reincarnated Buddha, who even has psychic powers, which he demonstrates on television. Obviously, that guy's a fraud. The TV said that he was the reincarnation of Buddha. Huh? There's no way that guy can be the Buddha. Because I know the real Buddha is... Hmm? Spoilers! It's Ryuho Okawa. I mean, they call his OC Sora no Taiyo, literally the sun in the sky, but uh, they both wear the same gaudy suits, both do the same stupid cross star exorcism thing, both emotionally manipulate young female celebrities. It's a one-to-one -one analog, basically. And pretty much the only reason the film gives us to believe that this guy in a fancy suit with psychic powers who claims to be the Buddha is legit, whereas this guy in a fancy suit with psychic powers who claims to be the Buddha is a big fat phony is source dude, trust me. That and the second dude dresses and acts like a B-grade supervillain. Secondly, the, uh, B-plot of this movie is, uh, I don't know how to put this without upsetting people. What if Mieroko-chan joined a cult? One day, out of the blue, intrepid high school reporter Sayako suddenly discovers that she can read her classmates' minds and see ghosts. These ghosts are all mangled and dark and spooky and shit. Acknowledging their presence puts her in danger, and when they're not menacing her, they go around possessing other people and causing problems for them. Now, Obviously, there are some differences in the lore here. Miroko-chan's mangled ghosts are products of all different kinds of grisly fates and evil intentions. If you're curious as to what sort of grisly fate, Yazi analyzes some of their designs in her hilarious new video comparing the Miroko manga to the anime. Whereas in Rebirth of Buddha, the purpose of all the ghosts everywhere is to literally demonize suicide victims. 
Content warning if you're sensitive about that stuff, because this movie really isn't. Suicides can't go to either heaven or hell until they spend their expected time of life in this world. So during that time, they possess family members or cause other people to die at the side of their suicide. It's gonna get pretty ugly from now on. Okay, one, I think we can all agree that kid going from zero to ape shit with the baseball bat is pretty funny. Two, though, what the fuck, man? Why does the one afterlife punishment Jeffrey Epstein's not getting gotta be so harsh? To be fair, Rebirth of Buddha does mark the first point in this series where I can honestly call a happy science movie a movie. It's got real characters, an almost cohesive contemporary setting, and a story that's more than an excuse to preach and lore dump. Slightly more, as you just heard, that is still a lot of the movie's runtime, but like, the first bit is just about establishing the characters and the protagonist's big problem. When the evil spirits show up, there's no exposition telling you why they're scary, at least not at first. The movie just does its best to make them scary. Some are at least as scary as any of the ghosts in the actual Mieroko anime, though that's more an indictment of Passion's adaptation than it is a point in Rebirth of Buddha's favor. Still, admittedly, the film is competently executed, at least comparatively speaking. But at the end of the day, that only makes the kooky cult crap stand out all the more. For example, that ghost who pulled Sayako onto the train tracks is decently spooky. Spookier still because it's someone she knew, a reporter she once looked up to named Kanemoto, who offed himself after a misreported scandal ruined his reputation. But before the scares can even settle in, she's inexplicably teleported to an afterlife courtroom where a trio of judgy judges lecture Kanemoto about how suicide's disrespectful to God and tut-tut about all these foolish materialists stinking up an arrow where the Buddha's been reincarnated. That's foreshadowing, by the way. Then they spring the trap door to hell on him, which is, again, pretty metal. Immediately following that, the coffee convo she has with the great value Bleachigo who pulled her off the train tracks reminds us just how relative a term competently executed can be. But what made you want to kill yourself? I would never think of killing myself! I'm sorry. After that, Homie whips out some napkin diagrams to explain happy science cosmology to her. Then they start arguing out of nowhere. He says, why are you always like this? And it's revealed after three minutes of these people being on screen talking to each other and us presuming they're strangers, that he's actually Sayako's college age ex-boyfriend who just happened to be walking by as she fell onto the train tracks in the middle of her I can see ghosts freak out. We don't even find out his name is Yuki until she's back at home reminiscing about her breakup, which, spoiler alert, was caused by him neglecting her for happy science meetings. One of the morals of this story is that if your boyfriend's cult is causing friction in your relationship, you should also join that cult and then everything will be fine. But don't join a bad cult though. We start learning that lesson the next day as Sayako's family is flipping through channels because nothing else interesting's on. People are witnessing UFOs across the country lately. And today, chaos erupted as police received thousands of calls from people who claim There's been a lot of strange UFO news lately. Skies. They surf their way to a talk show that's interviewing Arai, the fake Buddha who leads the Sonin group, where he makes some proclamations about the state of the world that are a touch extreme. Society today is ailing. Families are torn apart. Children kill their parents. Parents kill their children. The unhingedness of that statement is immediately overshadowed, though, when an earthquake hits and Arai uses telekinesis to save a newscaster from a falling light. The next day, he's all anyone can talk about. Hey, did you watch TV last night? Isn't Arai amazing? I heard he can do anything with his psychic powers. Well, it's still a religion. I mean, rebirth of Buddha? Come on. Let's see. Buddha. Wow. So many. 
Sayako leaps at the chance to interview him when her clubmates lazily pass the buck on it, figuring he might be able to tell her what's up with all these ding-dang ghosts she's seeing lately. This worries her ex, but she's not taking his text, so he has to run over to the Sonin Group temple to rescue her. And it's a good thing he does, because as Arise promises of psychic power in exchange for total obedience start winning the crowd over, the room starts filling up with this stinky black ghost smoke. When Ichibro rushes in, some Kaiba Corp goons pop out of the woodwork to stop them from leaving, but he warns them that there are TSI members waiting outside. For some reason, they don't call it happy science in this or the next movie. Then he uses a fire extinguisher as a smoke screen to escape. They run to a nearby park where Yuki almost name drops the real Buddha. Then, as they're bickering again, Sayako's little brother Shunta, who's been tagging along the whole time, trying to snap a pic of them kissing because... Uh... Don't think about why. Gets got by an evil spirit from the Sonin group that gives him a coconut-sized case of the ghost mumps. Their dad, who is a doctor, vows to save Shunta's life, but as a filthy, stupid atheist, he is of course both helpless and hapless in the face of this supernatural ailment. Sayako actually had another interview to do that same day, which obviously had to be canceled with her favorite pop idol, Mari Kimura, and she's a little bummed about that. Little does she know, Yuki actually knows Mari on account of how they're in a cult together. They show up to surprise her in the hospital lobby the next day with a random Australian dude in tow and tell her all about how Ryuho OC Do Not Steal Kawa can cure her brother. Then the man himself comes to the hospital and does just that by T-posing dominantly over the boy until the spook gets spooked out of his body and into the Australian guy. After an obligatory sermon on how sinners must repent and stuff if they want to leave hell and also a lame jump scare, Master Tayo exercises the beast, and just as an encore, he drops a plot twist on the family. You've got cancer, haven't what? you? What? Is that true? <sighs> He's got it exactly right. I've got six months left at best. There's absolutely nothing I can do about it. This plot point never comes up again. The demon mentions something before exploding about his evil master's evil master plan, which is already in motion, and to cut back to Arai's swaggy evil headquarters gives us a saucer-esque hint at what that might be. Sometime later, Sayako and Yuki are celebrating Shunta's recovery by taking him to a local festival for some stock anime shenanigans when she has some sort of psychic headache, and all of a sudden, an alien armada descends from the sky and begins obliterating Tokyo with death rays. Pretty sick looking death rays at that. Good job, animators. Less good job on the magic CGI lotus blossoms that Sayako summons with Sorano's help to make the aliens disappear, though. That was pretty lame. And don't even get me started on Arai's psychic defenses. Someone's interfering. The next day, of course, the UFO attack is all over the news. In a panel discussion with the walking macro-aggression from Laws of Eternity, a representative of the Sonin Group claims responsibility for stopping them. Objection. This contradicts the existing evidence of some messages on the internet and, quote, a fax from a woman in her 40s claiming that it was a mysterious girl who stopped the aliens, not a guy in a suit. Someone even got a picture, and blurring its face does absolutely nothing for Sayako. Oh my god, you're the mysterious savior girl. What? In no time, a media circus has descended upon her house, and she has to wear a disguise just to go and do normal things like meet her boyfriend and attend cult meetings. By the way, there's like a six minute scene smack dab in the middle of the movie where everyone literally just sits down to listen to Ryuho Okawa babble about smiling more. Riveting cinema. When the plot finally picks back up, Yuki picks Sayako up in a car to get her away from the reporters and to a TV station where Mari is doing a talk show so she can tell her story on her own terms, and they finally make up too. Meanwhile, the Sonin group charges into the NHK and violently takes over their broadcast before mirroring the signal to every other TV station in Japan. 
With all of the nation watching, Arai hypnotizes them into believing that a tsunami is about to hit, and tells them that if they swear to obey him, he can stop it. Evil ghostly chaos is kicking up as our heroes arrive at the station, and Mari warns them not to look at any TVs on account of the hypnosis. They rush to the studio to do something about the broadcast, but a bunch of IT thugs from the Sonin group ambush them in the hallway. Luckily, Mari and Yuki both know Kung Fu, and that shaman lady throws a mean psi blast, so they make it to the studio in one piece, ready to read a message of truth from Sora no Tayo. Unfortunately, the message got smudged along the way by the little kid who was carrying it, but luckily, astral projections work as teleprompters in a pinch. Through Sayako's lips, Sorano tells Japan that it's being duped by evil ghosts. Also, of course, he takes the opportunity to deliver another lengthy sermon. And despite Arai's best efforts, <laughs> his apocalyptic illusion is once again dispelled. With several failed plans under his belt and the cops hot on his tail now, the demonic entity that's been manipulating Arai decides to cut its losses and possess him outright to get it done right itself. Back at school, the media has only gotten circusier, so Sayako's hiding out with the newspaper and broadcast clubs who are very clearly just trying to use her for a scoop. You should use this opportunity to tell the truth, Sayoko even if it's just inside this school. Fake-ass bitch can't even get her name right. Eventually, Sayako sneaks out the back, only to get got by a spooky Evil Dead camera. A short while later, Sora no Tayo and his sidekicks have finally figured out the demon's true, dastardly scheme. And even if Arai's plan huh? fails... Nobody will trust religions because of what he did. This is not cool! But just then, Arai appears out of nowhere at a baseball game, kidnapped Sayako in tow, and his presence is announced by the world's greatest TV sportscaster. Why that's Tosaku Arai. Arai, who went missing after taking over a broadcasting station, has appeared with a mysterious girl, who's also been reported missing. Sayako! As a full-blown supervillain now, Arai threatens to blow up all 50,000 people in that stadium if Sayako doesn't announce to the world that he's the real Buddha. She can't bring herself to do it, though. The truth is just that important. So the demon tries to brainwash her into doing it anyway with an objectively correct argument. Are you going to kill all of these people? Are you saying that your faith is more precious than the lives of the 50,000 people here? She does have to think about that one for a second, long enough to flash back to the entire movie, but her ultimate answer to that question is a rather concerning yes. She tells everyone that Ryu, I mean, Sora no Tayo is the one true Buddha, and in response, instead of doing the bomb thing, Arai uses some M. Bison Juju to throw her off the pedestal and steal her soul. Then he claims that she was possessed by a demon and makes an absolute Hail Mary of a bluff, which almost works somehow. What's happened here today? Everything you've seen here is proof that I am the Buddha. The people of the stadium begin falling into darkness once more, but just in the nick of time, Tayo Sorano descends in a shaft of light to do what he does best. Bore evil into submission with an endless stream of vapid, vaguely spiritual aphorisms about happiness. Thinking only of one's own happiness is a characteristic of a foolish person. If you think only of your own happiness, it will lead to your spiritual death. Do not use your life only for your own interest. Wow, he's absolutely right. Tayo Serrano. It makes sense. Also, he uses a golden sword to turn her eyes tentacle UFO into bats, and the demon that was possessing the false Buddha reveals itself at last to be some dude with long hair. Sorano's wings protect the audience from the demon's black flames, and also, nuh uh, Buddha's immune to darkness based attacks, so the demon pulls out Sayako's stolen soul to use as a hostage, forcing Sorano to take his full power head on. But he's still Buddha and still immune to darkness based attacks, so, nuh uh, nothing happens to him again. 
The Dark Wizard throws an entire After Effects package at him. Still nothing. Sorano then counters by summoning a big white elephant from the sky, which he then rides for some reason and does the same cross star cut move to send the demon packing once and for all. Arai awakens and is worried that Sorano will kill him for, you know, trying to kill him, but the real Buddha assures him that he can redeem himself through self-reflection, causing him to cry and convert on the spot, along with all the evil Buddhist monk ghosts down in hell, I guess. It is worth noting that that fat, long-haired demon guy looks more than a little like the founder of another anime-producing Buddhist cult from the 90s, Om Shinrikyo, which tried to have Ryuho Okawa assassinated with VX gas a year before their infamous subway terror attack, so he might actually have been working through some stuff with this movie. Unfortunately, Sayako's soul seems to have been blasted away with the demon. I should have been the one to fill your dark soul with light! light, light. But the power of Bleachigo's Super Saiyan love is enough to reach her all the way in the spirit world, where their ghosts make out a bit, and then she comes back. A bunch of angels come flying in out of an IMVU banner ad to celebrate this great victory, and everyone in the audience transforms into one of their previous incarnations as a happy science follower to listen to one last excruciating sermon about Tayo's plans to build a theocratic autocracy. Or possibly a theme park. That I shall be reborn in this age and devote my life to build a Buddha land with you. Then the movie ends with the characters saying their goodbyes and going on with their lives in epilogue slides accompanied by a credits theme that puts most Christian rock I've heard to shame with its shamelessness. There is one and only one sun in the sky. There is only one Buddha. He's the only one on this earth because he speaks the words of life. He goes on preaching the law. Don't worry though, these movies can still get a lot less subtle. Remember Red Dawn? The Mystical Laws is basically Red Dawn if it was even less plausible and even more politically ham fisted. Also, instead of Russia invading America, it's China invading Japan. Though it still manages to follow the invasion up with an actual, literal, Thanks, Obama! But that's not what I was talking about when I slammed its lack of subtlety. See, in the mystical laws, it's not just China invading Japan. It's Nazi China. So the story goes, in the near future of 2020X, after it had already become the most powerful nation on Earth, a military coup led by General Tathagata Killer transformed the East Asian Republic, they don't actually call it China in the movie, into the Godom Empire, whose first order of business was to hang a bunch of McDonald's swastikas all over the place. Then, with their airtight control over the media, they managed to convince literally everyone in China that they're the good guys, with the swastikas hanging behind them, and get the whole country on board with uniting the world by absolute military force. For peace! And Japan, specifically the port town of Izumo, is the first stop on their world tour, but just as a test of their fancy social media censoring alien stealth submarines, which I'm sorry, I'm still hung up on those swastikas. It's just a super weird world building detail. The Godom Empire's logo could have been literally anything. It's not like they idolize Hitler or echo his ideology or any ideology for that matter besides really hating God. They're just generic bad guys trying to take over slash destroy the world with a discount Death Star for the glory of Catboy Satan. They even claim to be conquering for peace, so why would they willingly brandish the one brand that makes it automatically morally acceptable to beat the ever-loving shit out of anyone wearing it in a video game? I'm just saying, any modern military flying that flag, even one with real good parental controls on the public Wi-Fi, is gonna have soldiers asking... Are we the baddies? <laughs> I'll tell you who's a baddie, Leica Chan, the mysterious benefactor providing the mysterious technology that Godam uses in its weapons. Wait, 
right, I already spoiled that it's aliens. She's an alien. An alien baddie, that is. Ms. Ligachan. Well done. Anyway, after they test those stealth subs, it's only natural that the Empire's next target would be Taipei, the capital of Taiwan. Sorry, that's Bupei, the capital of Nan Tai. Oh, the Gotham Empire has released a statement. Nan Tai has been a long property of the Gotham Empire, thus will not accept any intervention from the international society. Ah! No what? cameras! Stop! No! We meet the movie's hero, Sho Shishimaru, in a triage tent in Bupei, working under Earth Doctors, a clear analog for Doctors Without Borders, which, in this film's universe, is also a front for happy science. Or rather, the secret society Hermes Wings. The leader of both organizations, the General, also happens to be in the camp at this time, on a rare trip outside his secure New York headquarters, and when he meets Sho, he's instantly impressed with the Doctor's angelically selfless attitude. Sho is equally impressed by a vision of the General getting shot and dying, but instead of mentioning that to him, he chooses to voice a different prediction. At this rate, Japan will be occupied in less than one week. What? Really? No way! That can't be! It really can't. Japan is just about the single most naturally defensible landmass on Earth outside arguably the Arctic Circle. Even with stealth subs to sneak into their heavily defended waters, any inland invasion of the mountainous island nation would be quite literally one giant uphill battle. The only way they go down in a week is if they lie down and roll over. Oh, right, I forgot. This is an anime Ben Garrison cartoon. It's bad! The U.S. Navy's aircraft carriers. Uh, well, uh, as many of you know, Japan cannot do uh, anything. As a matter of fact, Article 9 is written so that we cannot protect our people. You're saying it's time we pay for taking peace for granted? Article 9, if you're not familiar, is the section of the post-World War II Japanese constitution that renounces war. Just starting wars, though. It doesn't stop them from defending themselves. In fact, Japan's self-defense force has the ninth largest budget of any army on Earth. Polls show that most Japanese people actually appreciate how Article 9 keeps them out of American forever wars, but nationalists see it as a mark of shame and really want it gone. The specter of invasion is a handy bogeyman for pushing that agenda. For context, an American equivalent of this oft-echoed mistruth would be saying a Democrat president weakened the army by moving money into social programs or something like that. We've been drastically slashing our military expenditure for fiscal reconstruction. <sighs> we no longer are the police of the world. And there's the thanks, Obama. Okay, technically it's not Obama, it's Tom Buck, and I suppose he could be referencing a different black president, but given the time this was made, yeah, it's Obama. Speaking of when this was made, fun fact, in 2011, when they would have been scripting and storyboarding it, the U.S. had its highest military budget in history. And so did Japan! So these dire political predictions are literally based on nothing. Okay, I've been talking for a while now, and we're only 10 minutes into the movie. Sorry, but this is the first time this cult's gotten this overtly political with its crazy fear-mongering, and that just leaves a fucking lot to unpack. I mean, when Godom actually does conquer Japan about 50 minutes in, one of the first super duper evil things they're shown doing is forcing school children to learn about Nanking. The Japanese once caused great harm and did many bad things, forcing its neighboring countries to suffer immensely. But now, with the help of our great emperor, they are finally starting to become decent citizens. For context, they put that in the same montage where the Empire outlaws speaking Japanese and starts executing religious people. All religions are prohibited in Gotham. Death to offenders and their families. P please, spare my child. <laughs> Take them away. No, not my daddy! That said, the ultimate purpose of this isn't actually to advance any sort of political agenda. Their real goal is to entice members of Japan's far right, who already agree with that message of the film, into listening to its real message, which is 
give El Cantare all your devotion and money. So, much as I'd love to keep tearing apart this film's flimsy worldview, I wrote 4,700 words worth of notes about it. We should really move on to the main plot. In the next meeting of his evil council, after he fries a guy with his electric whip for being annoying, Dollarama Darth Vader reveals that he's reverse-engineered the technology Leica Chan lent the Empire and is using it to build the ultimate destructive weapon. Ultimate destructive weapon? <clears throat> his glorious majesty will name the weapon once it's been completed. What a fantastic excuse to just never name your movie's central MacGuffin. The weapon in question is able to create a six trillion degree fireball and drop it anywhere on Earth, which Leica's none too happy about, warning Tathagata Killer that overusing such a power could compromise the Earth's crust and render it uninhabitable. But the Emperor is confident that he just needs one Alderaan example to make the world fall in line. Godom is facing heavy opposition, after all. Why, Sho and his supervisor Urano have moved from the doctor division of Earth Doctors to its G.I. Joe politician bodyguard program. The Godoms are here. They're behind us. I never expected you to be a member of a secret society like the Hermes Wings. Sir, I'm sorry I kept it from you. Uh -oh. Deja vu! I've just been in this place before! Higher on the street and I know it's my time to go! And Sho's psychic visions are coming in handy for getting them out of trouble. Eventually, the Society's activities attract the Empire's direct ire. The secret society Hermes Wings is active. With their headquarters in New York, they are publicly known as a religious group, the Earth Doctors, a political party, and an educational institution. Wow, what a coincidence! That's also all the things Happy Science is! But behind their covers, they protect politicians and advocators who resist us. These goons are trying to spread liberal thoughts against our imperialism. They are no threat to us. No need to report such minuscule deeds. Lightning whip! All obstacles must be terminated. I shall not tolerate an incomplete world. And I guess they learned their lesson from Hermes' Winds of Love because the big bads actually follow up on that threat. Our branches are under attack around the world. How's that possible? The security system and the surveillance cameras had been enhanced against attacks. We're not uh, safe here. Guys, guys. The General's been moving from base to base every four hours, trying to stay ahead of Godom's assassins. But as he reaches Sho's office, his luck finally runs out, and Chinese Nazi Section 9 catches up with him. Before they can stealth camo their way up to him, however, he has time to deliver a stirring speech. We will pursue love and justice. I swear it on the name of Hermes Wings. And in a surprise twist, reveal that he's chosen a successor. The next general is Sho Shishimaru. <laughs> Sho's former boss, Urano, doesn't seem to be taking this too well. Wonder if that'll come up later. Sho isn't super confident about doing the job either, but the whole rest of the office seems to believe in him. That's not true, Sho. You can do it. I agree. You'll do fine. All of us here support you too. <laughs> These dubs are a real treat. The second the General met Show, he just knew in his heart that the young doctor would be the one to carry on his mission. And that mission is to find... The Savior's symbol. A key to saving this world. It seems it is in the ancient Incan ruins under Lake Titicaca. <laughs> the Godums! Leave right now! After a short, shitty shootout with a couple cool shots in it, Sho and Urano managed to get the general to his secret bunker, and oh hey, it did come up later! Well, what's that huh? for? What do you think? Urano! <laughs> As for why Urano did it, besides being pissed over getting passed over for promotion, I mean, who doesn't like money? The villains in these movies are fun. Before he can finish off Sho, though, the lights go out and the room floods with sleeping gas. Sho awakens in the hotel room of two Indian Buddhist monks who saved him, and they reveal that while he was asleep, he got another promotion. 
We have run you through a very thorough background check. The chief here believes that you, Sho Shishimaru, are the reincarnation of Buddha. You are the world's light of hope. You are the light of hope for our world. Wait, you mean the light of hope for the world? I want you to be our, no, the world's light of hope. That's not our edit, by the way. Sometimes this film just straight up makes fun of itself. They know shows the Buddha on account of how they dug out a golden urn earlier in the movie containing a prophecy saying that he is. And they know it's legit because scientific analysis has revealed that the urn is both 2,500 years old and from space. The old man hands show an introductory Buddhist text to get him started, and he heads off to Tokushima to set up a new Hermes Wings office and start meditating under a conveniently located Bodhi tree. Soon enough, he's having visions, first a glimpse of some sort of goddess, then a nightmare of Godom invading Japan with kaiju, and a little kid gets shot. Oh god, it's Mass Effect 3 all over again! Meanwhile, Tathagata Killer is communing with some sort of demon, bragging about how he's a perfect human who don't need no parents, or God for that matter, cause that God guy sure does suck, and he gets so worked up about how much he hates God that he just starts jizzing force lightning everywhere. As an atheist, I hate it when that happens. Back by the Bodhi tree, Sho's taken a break to enjoy the cherry blossoms when Konohana no Sakuya, who was that goddess lady from earlier, appears by his side to give a sermon, because there's always a fucking sermon, about how the spirit world works. Which is basically just Cliff's Notes Laws of Eternity, though in addition to Nazis, Nietzsche, and a bunch of secular TV personalities Ryuho Okawa clearly has beef with, this time they also blame demons for Charles Darwin and Karl Marx. She concludes the lecture by telling Sho that she's not Sho if he can change the dark future in his visions or not, but he won't know unless he tries. So he calls a helicopter to head for the scene of the pre-crime. Down in the Fireballinator labs, Leica Chan has her own vision of the ultimate destructive weapon wiping out an entire alien city and heads up to Tathagata Killer's room to beg him not to use it one more time. He picks this moment to shoot his shot and, after getting shot down, throws a Darth Vader tantrum to get his way with her, but her magic bracelet weakens his grip and she manages to escape. As this is happening, as the Japanese government is busy planning their immediate surrender and also saying the quiet part loud, A colony. That means Japan will cease to exist. It's better than fighting and getting killed. I'll flee somewhere before that, of course. As JSDF fighters are blown out of the sky one by one because the cowardly Prime Minister is just too darn committed to Article 9 to do anything with them, Sakuya summons forth Yamata no Orochi to defend Japan in their stead, which appears in the form of snake-like clouds that swallow planes whole, causing them to crash. Godom's got its own ghost kaiju, though, a black dragon of evil energy that repels Orochi's assault. As the two beasts, or clouds depending on your perspective, face off, Sho arrives on the scene, desperate to avert the doom that he's foreseen. But his grand plan of running door to door telling people to leave proves insufficient and a lot of Okinawans die. He does save that one kid in the shack though, so there is hope that the rest of the future can be changed. For now though, or five months after now, Godom's hanging swastikas on Shibuya Station and cruelly teaching kids about their ancestors' Axis war crimes. Wait, Shell may not be able to stop this, but at least he's been keeping up with his meditation all this time, and his devotion is rewarded at last when Rient Arl Crowd, the made-up king of Happy Science's made-up pre-Roman ancient Incan Empire, and one of the incarnations of the eternal Buddha El Cantare, appears before him and bestows upon him a sacred ritual which involves praying under the tree tomorrow night. Back at HQ, there's even more good news. Hermes Wings has at last unearthed the Savior's symbol from Lake Titicaca, and it's the same crystal staff that was wielded by Rient Arl Crowd in Sho's vision. He of course prays under the tree the next night, and a mysterious Jedi-esque figure answers his call. 
You performed the sacred ritual to call UFOs. That's why I'm here. I came from Venus. My name is Yuptika. You're not surprised seeing an alien? Well, I can sense that you really mean no harm to me. I'm impressed. But even you don't know that the Godam Empire is using the technologies of an extraterrestrial civilization. Utica goes on to detail the history of Venus, which we already covered in the Laws of the Sun Roast last video, and tells him that he's Rient Arl Crowd. Then he flips on his teleporter and whisks Show off to Godom to meet Lake Achan. I guess in the end she was just too much of a baddie to stay bad. Or keep her hair color. Okawa likes his wife who's blonde. To me, you look like you're Scandinavian. Here on Earth, that is. She force grabs Show with her magic bracelet and brings him over to her, but he calls down some angels to free him from the golden rings and pick her up for good measure. Then they drop her so he can pick her up, giving Wingman a whole new meaning, and they settle in for exposition over tea. Turns out, Leica's true identity is Theta, the princess of planet Vega in the Lyra system. Years ago, one of their planetary neighbors also developed the Forbidden Weapon and also neglected to name it before dropping it on Vega, rendering the surface unlivable. Unwilling to spend the rest of her life as a mole person, Theta prayed to the god of Earth, Rient Arl Crowd, whom she knows because her people hail from Venus, and he granted them a spiritual immigration pass, which one million Vegan souls chose to take, despite general worries that Earth is kind of a shitty neighborhood. And not only can those souls enter female bodies, nice to be reborn as humans, they can also do ghost ride-alongs with already grown people to learn the ins and outs of life here. And they choose China as their port of entry because it's easier to do that possession thing in countries that don't acknowledge spiritual presence and, more importantly, don't have a strict census registry system. That is the most weirdly specific dig at a country I have ever heard. Some Vegans also came over in spaceships, and they, like Theta, are able to shapeshift and pass as human. She uses this ability to start a trading company as Lake Achan, selling Vegan ore and tech to fund their immigration, which eventually brought her into contact with Tathagata Killer, who, as a brilliant scientist and military man even before he became the Emperor, immediately pegged her tech as alien in origin. And she ultimately decided to lend her alien weaponry to his upcoming global military coup for three reasons. Firstly, his plan to bring about world peace by killing everyone who opposes him with alien super weapons would help her in convincing the holdouts back on Vega that Earth isn't a war-torn hellhole, eventually, maybe. Second, he offered her a bribe. I will give you Africa for your people to immigrate to. And third, he had really sad eyes at the time. In the years since, though, those eyes have changed, gotten meaner and sharper. Guess being a tyrannical despot does that to you. And now, with his power over the Vegan immigrants, Theta has no way of opposing him, even as he nears completion of the ultimate destructive weapon. The ultimate destructive weapon. But Sho's eyes remind her of none other than Rient's Arl Crowd which gives her hope that something might still be done. And together, the two planet's saviors hatch a plan to have Vegan plants and the Godom army help show infiltrate and destroy the weapon. First, though, we've got to cut away to a random scene of him meditating under the tree again back in Japan, which I guess means he went back there prior to doing the raid on the... It doesn't matter. What matters is he has another vision telling him that those rascally reptalians are up to their old legal loophole tricks again. We will attack the moment the ultimate destructive weapon is used. Intervening when the people living on this planet try to destroy their own civilization does not violate the Galactic Treaty. We will instantaneously take Earth before our food starts wiping out each other. For those keeping score at home, that is three secret groups of aliens orbiting Earth, all revealed in the space of 20 minutes. 
Also in the same vision, Riantarl Crowd warns show that if humankind takes a wrong path, the consciousness of Earth might wipe us all out with natural disasters. To avert this future and the fireball one, show calls on his followers around the world to speak up for God and against Gotham in a big multilingual montage. Hermes Wings is active around the world. Report to his majesty. Which prompts the president himself to make a statement. We choose justice. Let all countries unite and protect our freedom. Thanks, Tom Buck. Though, in the end, that only gives Tafagata Killer the excuse he was looking for to laugh maniacally and launch the weapon, so... Thanks, Tom Buck. Sho dons his stealth camo and busts into the lab to put a stop to that, hooking up with a squad of Vagan commandos along the way, but right before they reach the weapon, they're ambushed by Godom forces, and when a blaster shot slips through their laser shield phalanx and kills one of them, our hero nobly surrenders himself to prevent any more carnage. Stop! That's enough! I don't want to lose any more friends! who are fighting for Earth! As he's taken into custody, Sho's followers around the world are all rounded up too, and forced to watch along with the rest of humanity as the Emperor makes a big televised event out of the execution. To be executed as a traitor and terrorist, Sho Shishimaru, the cursed leader of the evil secret society, Hermes Wayne! That incredibly subtle three-story stainless steel crucifix is ultimately just for show. The actual deed is done by firing squad, and the savior dies in a matter of seconds. But then, Theta reveals her alien form and rushes to his side, calling down flying saucers to use their healing rays, I guess, on him. It doesn't work, so she tries the thing that always works, prayer, and after a quick trip to the ninth dimension so Buddha can tell him he's God, shows back on his feet and ready for one final big dumb anime fight. And since all the soldiers are too awed by his Jesus act to pull the trigger anymore, that ends up coming down to horrible CGI skeletons versus even more horrible CGI angels. The horrible CGI kaiju also pop in to duke it out overhead, and with the forces of good winning on all of these fronts, the demon panics, possesses Tafagata Killer, and force pulls Theta over to force her to activate the ultimate destructive weapon using a horrible CGI nuke suitcase. The distraction of a streaker running onto the field gives Tathagata just enough pause to remember Leica's kindness, and he hilariously electrocutes himself to stop the demon but then it just turns into a smoke monster and does the same thing anyway, making that a complete waste of a scene. Then things get even worse. We were waiting for this moment to take over Earth. Oh, oh crap. Earth's conscience is going to clean out the world. Sho has a plan, though, which he conveys in the form of yet another lengthy sermon, of course. If everyone on Earth just prays to him, he, and only he, can stop these natural disasters before they kill us all. Which I can't help but noticing is the exact same ultimatum the fake Buddha bad guy from the last movie used at the end of Act 2 to show us how evil and manipulative he is. But dude, trust me, this time's legit. With the Savior's symbol in hand, handily handed off to him by that streaker from earlier right before the cops shot him in the back, he's able to summon up a spirit bomb from the light of every human soul and with it dispel the darkness and stop the disasters. Though not before an earthquake conveniently knocks the weapon that shall not be named out of alignment and stops it from firing. And as he's capping off that sermon by rambling about how Earth is the planet of love, Utica heads up to tell the reptalians where they can shove it. The crisis has left. Abide by the Galactic Treaty. You are the ones who intervened first. You violated the Galactic Treaty. Let me remind you. Intervention is permitted only when those living on this planet try to destroy their own civilization. Am I correct?
Back on Earth, Tathagata Killer's mask finally falls off to reveal his true identity. He was born as a secret, experimental clone soldier created by the Chinese army, which he thinks makes him an object, but Sho tells him that in spite of that, he is still God's child. Then he dies, happy tears in his eyes. Sometime later, Sho and Theta are dating, apparently, but she's got to go back to get the rest of her people on Veda, so after one last heavy makeout sesh, they have to say a tragic goodbye, vowing to meet again in another life, on another planet, and make it work. And the film ends with Ryuho Okawa's OC living his best single life as a super popular, rich, and successful international savior figure. An ending I'm sure has nothing to do with the messy divorce the real Okawa went through while this movie was being made. And with that, we are finally, finally done with these movies. Not all of them, there's still a whole superhero trilogy left to roast, but I've got to wait until the third one of those, which was written by Ryuho Okawa's daughter, is out on Blu-ray to give all of them their proper due. We've had our laughs at all the obviously ridiculous shit in these movies, but we can only do that because they're not really made for us as an audience. The goal of this propaganda, outside the last movie's pandering to the far right, isn't to recruit new followers, it's to build an immersive media ecosystem that reinforces for existing believers, kids especially, the idea that Happy Science's ideas are normal and pop-culturally acceptable. They're also, obviously, products meant to be sold to those existing marks. Same reason half of Okawa's lectures get transcribed into books. Moving massive quantities of merch is just how this church extracts an average of $1,500 a year from its members. Who doesn't like money? And while you and I are by and large immune to this specific strain of propaganda, except for those we lost as converts to the Catboy Satan thing, that was a big oversight on my part. That is by no means true of most media like these movies. All films, shows, ads, games, and anime are built on certain assumptions about how the world works, and intentionally or not, serve to reinforce those assumptions and whatever status quo they might support whenever we watch them. Also, almost always intentionally, almost all media is trying to sell you something with those ideas some of which might be ludicrous or even demonstrably harmful, yet if they are, that's just as invisible to any of us who already buy in as the sheer lunacy of I'm Helen Keller is to its target audience. Nobody is immune to propaganda. But by learning how to unpack what art is saying and how and why it's saying it, we can inoculate ourselves to a degree against the worst of it. That's part of why I do what I do. I mean, mostly it's a way to get away with watching cartoons and playing video games for a living, and also for this specific series, I just happen to think this cult is hilarious. But media literacy is important too, and I think one of the best ways to build it is to see how bad media conveys bad ideas badly. Because when you understand what films like these are doing wrong, you also come to understand implicitly what better constructed media and propaganda does right. More importantly though, when you watch crazy movies like this, you get to discover and share comic gold like this with your friends. The keys are the US, Russia, and India. We're dead goose if they decide to nuke us all simultaneously. <sighs> Miss Lekachan, isn't there a miraculous super weapon? Something that will wipe out an entire nation? No, there isn't. What a shame. Your amazing secret technology is useless when we need it most. If you appreciate the effort it takes to bring you such delights, then I'd appreciate you letting me know via a comment, or if you're really feeling it, a like, share, and or subscribe. I'm Jeff Thu, professional future, uh, self-help guru, signing out from Definitely not a compound. On March 2nd, 2023, the world was shaken by the sudden passing of Ryuho Okawa. Truly 
It was a dark day for all of mankind. However, that night became infinitely brighter when I felt the spirit of the Master take hold of me and impart the following message to the world he loved so much. Boy, I sure do love drinking delicious blue flavor gamer sups out of my sexy new cat girl waifu cup. Wow! It tastes so blue! And all of it was 10% off with the promo code BASEMENT! <laughs> Konnichiwa! Boku wa okawa ryuho sama sensei desu! Whoa! Now I speak English! Truly, my miracles know no bounds! Mr. Jeffrey Basement-san, while I have left this world to perform my works elsewhere in the cosmos, your work is yet to be complete. You have already enlightened humanity to the wicked machinations of Catboy Satan, the brilliant beauty of Helen Keller, and the villainy of Freddy Nietzsche's. <laughs> God is dead! God is dead! But they have yet to see my greatest creation, the Laws of the Universe Superhero Trilogy, which I personally co-wrote with the ghost of Stan Lee. Also, he helped me write a book about story structure and how space people are real. Hurry, Basement Kun, before the Japanese Diet can pass more anti-cult legislation! The people must know how awesome my movies are, just like you told them in your last two videos. On an unrelated note, did I mention I only just learned fluent English after transcending my physical form? The other, other politicians in the U.S. are always afraid of you know, criticism in the press. Oh, but really? why you can be so tough? Uh, criticism is a uh, New York cheesecake. Uh, for me, every criticism uh, uh, will be my advertising because I'm strong. At long... Long last, we've reached the final leg of our journey, and the cult's most ambitious project yet. Happy Science strives to be the all-encompassing cinematic universe of world religions and ancient alien conspiracy theories. So it feels appropriate, perhaps even inevitable, that they'd try to build their own cinematic universe to rival that of the most profitable cult on Earth, Disney. The Laws of the Universe Parts 0, 1, and Age of Elohim take all the things you love about modern superhero blockbusters and enhance them through the infinite wisdom of El Cantare. For instance, Part 0, true to its subtitle, takes everyone's favorite bit of every superhero narrative, the origin story, specifically the part where they're ordinary teenagers with no powers running around their high school, and stretches it out to fill over two hours. So, no big cool superhero battles, no small stupid superhero battles for that matter. Uh, just an endless series of bait and switch scenes where every apparent plot setup just ends up leading to another exposition dump. All framed around this huge air quotes teen drama about a group of students trying to prove that aliens are real for their class project while everyone bullies them. Professor, if you really think this will is more intelligent than humans, then are you implying that it might be aliens? Hmm. Take us to your leader. Take us to your leader. How dumb. Is he kidding? I'm uh, pretty sure aliens don't exist. In case you're wondering, yes, that was Josh Keaton playing Protag Kun Ray, and he's not even the only Spider-Man in this film. Yuri Lowenthal also plays his best friend Tyler. Also, their curly-haired comic relief buddy Aisuke is played by Sonic the Hedgehog, Roger Craig Smith. And that's just the start of how shockingly stacked this dub is, but I digress. I am worried that clip may have led you to believe that the background dialogue in this film, at least, is somewhat organic and believable, so allow me to immediately dispel that misconception. Why are you just now arriving to class? Natsumi will be fine. Natsumi's his girlfriend's little sister. His little <sighs> sister once they get married. Oh yeah! Uh, for context, that teacher is mad at Tyler and Haley for being slightly late to class after his little sister once they get married. Oh yeah! passed out in the lunchroom for no apparent reason. 
Uh, the teacher then goes on to yell at the entire class about rumors that some students may be attending a secret cram school, which we later learn is called the Genius School from Aceke secretly filming seniors talking about it in the bathroom, which is extremely normal behavior, super organic plot device for introducing that exposition, Great job, writers. Anyway, cramming isn't allowed here because Nazca Academy is an elite college prep high school, and those kinds of places famously don't want their students doing any extracurricular studying. Now, that may actually be the movie attempting to, like, gaslight happy science kids into thinking that every school works like their weird one, but if it's not, that profoundly contrived rule seems to exist solely to justify the kids not going to their teachers about Natsumi passing out, since she also went to that genius school before it started happening. Instead, carrying on the pattern of extremely normal behavior, they ask Ray's girlfriend Anna's elementary school guidance counselor, Professor Yoake, to meet them in an abandoned clubhouse at midnight where he extracts Natsumi's memories using hypnosis, revealing in the process that some classic Roswell aliens abducted her from the cram school and were about to do brain surgery on her before they hit some space turbulence and had to stop. But they've also done that same surgery successfully on other Nazca students, implanting them with microchips that give them photographic memories, but also jaundice, and of course, turn them evil. The next day, Professor Yoake shows up to give a surprise lecture, and Ray embarrasses himself in front of everyone like you saw earlier, leading him to realize he's found the perfect topic for him and his friends to present in their creation studies class, proving that aliens are real. Also, they decide to call themselves Team Future, which will definitely help with the bullying, and Buddy's so excited to do all that homework that he starts Sentai posing in the quad, which catches the attention of those microchipped students and causes them to do absolutely nothing until the last half hour of the movie. It does seem like they might be about to do something when Aceke overhears them plotting a midnight meetup over summer break and Tyler sneaks out to spy on them, but then, before he can catch up with them and film whatever nefarious thing they're doing, he's caught in a tractor beam and abducted, so th that just goes nowhere. And you might think the meeting was a fake-out and the abduction is some plot about to actually finally happen, especially when he meets the group the next day wearing suspicious bandages and right-wing influence or shades, but then he immediately takes those off, his eyes are fine, and it turns out he was grabbed by an entirely unrelated group of hot blonde aliens who took him to Pleiades to learn more exposition about the evil reptilians and how the gray aliens are actually just robots who work for them. Also, there's some stuff about how you can go faster than light if you pass through the spirit world, and in the middle of that giant exposition dump, the movie has the absolute gall to say this. Too many details. Let's get back to the story. Now, Tyler's friends are pretty skeptical when he tells them those blonde aliens are good, actually. I'm pretty sure you can't trust someone who just comes right out and declares how wonderful they are. Something tells me Tyler wasn't thinking with his head. <laughs> hey, come on! Yeah, guys, come on! His little sister, once they get married's older sister, is right there! But speaking of his little sister once they get married, it turns out Natsumi was also abducted by a third unrelated group of exposition aliens last night. Ape men who took her to Alpha Centauri to warn her that the reptilians have agents in the militaries of America, Russia, and China, and also in their school's faculty for some reason. And when she says that those monkey aliens were innately good, everyone's just like, yeah, that, that totally makes sense. I guess they were just charmed by how much cuter the animation in that bit was. Also, both groups of aliens refuse to give the kids any proof that they exist for as yet unexplained reasons, so this scene, once again, does literally nothing to move the plot forward in any way. Anywho, fast forward to the day of the presentation, which for some reason is in the middle of the culture festival, and Team Future is raring to go, but oh no, the reptilians ate their homework! So Ray's just gotta sorta wing it, causing everyone in school to make fun of him 
again and the principal to yell at him. But just then, a tractor beam shoots through the window and brings the both of them to talk to the giant goat man from the space UN, played by Jet Black himself, Bo Billingsley. They've implanted an unknown number of humans with microchips. Who shows them an alien transfer station on the far side of the moon and explains that the Galactic Federation Treaty forbids the space UN from interfering with underdeveloped planets, which is why none of the good aliens from before could give them any proof they exist. Uh, sorry, would you mind explaining all of this? Uh... On second thought, I'm good, thanks. However, there's a loophole in the treaty where if enough human brainwaves resonate with alien brainwaves via the law of attraction, then they can interfere. And the reptilians are using microchips and their connections with various power-hungry militaries to make that happen for them, who are also power-hungry. But if the good humans can convince everyone on Earth to think positively first, then the Space UN can come in to save the day. But no sooner has that exposition been dumped than some bad aliens come to shoot lasers at their ship, and they have to send Ray and the principal back in time to before the tractor beam hit. So, in case you were wondering if any plot would be advanced by that happening, nope. Everyone still thinks they're crazy, except the principal, who gives a big speech in his office the next day, over a little Easter egg referencing the first Happy Science movie. That's cute. About how he's seen the truth now, and he doesn't need proof to believe it. This time, though, in a surprise twist, they actually do have proof, because the Goat Chancellor accidentally sent Ray back with a moon rock, which they hid in the club room last night. But, oh no, wouldn't you know it, the fucking reptilians got to that too, so... Once again, the plot can't advance, and the principal walks away. Still fully believing them, I should note, but not actually doing anything about the aliens in the school. And because there are no signs of a break-in in this club room that presumably lots of people have access to and also the window is open, Tyler suggests there must be a spy among them, which makes Natsumi very upset. It's probably me! I'm the one! I must have done it! I probably snuck out of the dorm late last night and then came here and stole the moon rock! It all makes sense! I'm just a puppet for the reptilians now! This then causes Anna to yell at Ray, even though it was Tyler who started all that, and she storms out saying she never, ever wants to talk to either of them ever again. This sets up a sad montage over an English language original Happy Science rock song. Don't forget my love. And then, the next morning, they all just uh, completely forget they were arguing, and they're all friends again, and they meet up at the professor's lab to try out his new psychic space phone, which sends their souls up to the spaceship of an invisible talking B-man who reveals that he's been piggybacking in Aisuke's body for years to learn about Earth. Which is pretty darn creepy, but I, I can't fault his reasons for doing it. Well, during my observations, I discovered I'm rather fond of your Earth-made cartoons. Japanese anime is especially good. To answer your burning questions, yes, that is SpongeBob. And yes, he's been watching him masturbate. Does that also mean you were watching me when I thought I was all alone? You violated my privacy! I won't tell anyone what I saw. <laughs> the bug man says he's taking them to Pleiades, but not the one with all the hot blondes. That's Pleiades 5. No, they're going to Pleiades 3, home to an elite space university where they teach future space Jesuses how to give happy science sermons. Then they immediately leave that university without getting or learning anything from it. Unfortunately, Spongebug Thorax Pants isn't a very good driver in this universe either, so his ship broke down on landing and they have to hitch a ride back in a different spaceship, which takes them on a detour to Vega. And that's apparently where Anna's soul is from. 
There it's revealed in front of a series of hideous CG backgrounds, including this statue of a hairy naked muscle man, that all of them are from other planets actually, leading to even more exposition about the mechanics of happy science reincarnation. Which, if you haven't seen my previous roasts, has some weird elements of prosperity gospel mixed into it. You were an aristocrat in your past life. Seriously? Is that so hard to imagine? Anyway, almost none of this barely disguised happy science preaching has any impact on the rest of the movie, or any of the other ones, but seeing their true selves does help the characters decide what they want to be when they grow up. Except Ray, who can't decide between JSDF pilot or cop, so that's... something? And hey, when they do get back from their trip, the plot is finally ready to start happening. The kids from the genius school. I'm afraid they're on the move now. They're gathering everyone in the football field. The microchip kids have Natsumi up on a stage now and announce to the gathered students that they're about to turn her into a genius by doing just the goofiest little dance to summon a UFO. But Team Future shows up just in time to make a pentagram with their magic glowing soul marbles and send the scary black spiky UFO packing. And a nicer, whiter, much softer UFO from the Space UN takes its place. The only reason we are here is thanks to the strength and integrity of Team Future, who has managed to form a spiritual magnetic field that has allowed us in at last. <sighs> The Goat Man and Blonde Yushanka Lady offer to make a pact with humanity, so long as they understand how important it is to do science and spirituality at the same time, especially the spirituality part. But then, the school janitor takes over the PA and reveals that he was the reptilian spy all along. And honestly, every line out of that guy's mouth is just Iconic. We know all about you and your agents in the American, Chinese, and Russian militaries, and we're going to stop you. Oh, yeah? The reptilians in America are no friends of mine. We are enemies. But we are smarter, more powerful, and much stronger than they can ever hope to be. Why can't you understand me? I am number one in the entire universe! Now, our heroes may have the power of God and anime on their side, but this space janitor has something even stronger. Legal loopholes. The governments of Earth are requesting contact with the reptilians. Because no rules have been violated, the Federation is unable to intervene. Revealing that the school was just a decoy, and his true plan was to gather the Galactic Federation and Guardians of the Earth in one place to finish them all off, the janitor uses a space garage door opener to summon an even bigger, scarier UFO, which fires a beam of black energy at the ground that threatens to suck the entire Earth into the Dark Side universe. He reveals this weapon was lent to him by Dahar, servant of the evil god of the Dark Side universe. And that's not the only powerful ally he has on his side. <laughs> I have allied with the Chinese military. We'll seize power in Asia, and then our final plan, bringing down those horrid American reptilians, the bane of my existence. Then we'll be the winners! After he's done talking, our heroes get sucked into the Dark Side universe, which looks pretty much exactly like regular downtown Tokyo, only slightly dirtier. Also, everyone is evil reptilians there, so they're in big trouble. But then, Ray remembers that he was that big, muscly, hairy alien guy from the statue in a past life, and awakens to his superpowers, finally kicking off the only action scene in this entire superhero movie, one hour and 45 minutes in. It lasts exactly four minutes, and Rey accomplishes precisely nothing. Then a dragon just swoops in out of nowhere to save them. Bringing them back to the school field, the dragon reveals that he's actually the teacher who yelled at them at the start of the movie, who was a good reptilian all along. Then he tells them they gotta pray real hard to El Cantare if they want to get out of this mess. So they do, and he sends a big stream of god piss to wash away all the scary black CGI. Holy shit, this makes Quantumania look like a masterpiece. Though, with that said, the janitor's villain exit is just... Uh, no! Converted reptilians, 
What is wrong with these fools? Ah! Of course, an alien invasion movie wouldn't be complete without the guys who didn't do anything saying, Our work here is done. Yes, time to go. And a uh, side note, uh, the fact that that blonde lady is also a tentacle monster just never comes up again. And of course, a happy science movie wouldn't be complete without one of the characters given essentially a sermon for about five minutes while a bunch of fireworks go off and everyone sits around listening. The hardest part of it all lies within us. But perhaps most importantly, a superhero movie isn't complete without a post credit scene teasing the true identity of the secret mastermind behind the scenes. The President of the United States has a matter to discuss with you, sir. Excellent timing. I have business to discuss with him myself. Ni hao. Spoiler alert! You're never gonna see that guy again! They, they just wanted to fit in a little more racism. So I guess we should follow the movie's lead and just move on to. Laws of the Universe Part 1 picks up several years after its prequel, with all the members of Team Future now pursuing their dreams at Nazca University. Anna's living with Ray and working on storyboards for film class. Aisuke is going for his teaching degree, but also he's become a super popular singer-songwriter who gets covered on the news because he had one viral video blow up. That's how that works. Haley's studying happy science textbooks for religion class, and Tyler's busy standing her up for dates as he works late in the UFO lab with Professor Yoake. Ray, though, is a little more troubled by the prophetic dreams that he's been having about a mysterious black knight stabbing him in the face, and still hasn't decided what his career should be. Tyler's really been riding his ass about that, because he feels like by slacking off, Ray is breaking a promise they made between movies, while Ray contends that Tyler's just wasting his time playing with gadgets. But before the argument about that can escalate, Tom Kenny creeps up on everyone to tell them the reptilians are invading again, and what's more, It is truly the biggest fleet I have ever seen! A fleet they're using to, I shit you not, abduct cows. And not even farmers with shotguns can stop them. On a genuinely positive note, the reptilian designs have been greatly improved from the fugly Yoshi Cybermen we're used to seeing in these cult movies. Now we got crocodile men, duckbill dinosaur dudes, platypus guys, and saber-toothed tiger. I'm not sure these guys actually know what reptiles are, but that's not going to stop them from eating this screaming white lady and her kid. Luckily, not only does Ray have his superpowers from the last 10 minutes of the last movie, but all the other kids are superheroes too now, as the giant goat man so helpfully explains. Do not worry. They've learned to utilize the galaxy force and have been using it for three years. Wait, the galaxy what now? The galaxy force. It's the force that awakens you to the special powers that you once had on the planet before coming to Earth. Thanks, giant goat man. And of course, they wouldn't be cool superheroes without their cool superhero names, such as... Space Commander. Phantom Illusion. Absolute Sanctuary. Invisible Spear. And we can't forget the coolest one of all, White Knight! Now, I could go into what each of these kids' powers do, but as you'll soon see, that would be a complete waste of time, so I won't. However, I will play this clip out of context. I am just a freedom-loving rock and roller. No one can stop me now. After White Knight and Space Commander have speared slash punched the UFOs away, the reptilians turn their scaly tails and run. But while Ray thinks they should just call it a night since the enemy's already given up, Tyler disagrees. Wait a minute, what are you saying? This is our chance to take out the big boss. Unfortunately for White Knight, that big boss, who looks an awful lot like Nagito Danganronpa, has his own plans in store. I think you'll be of more use to me than these ones. <laughs> See, under happy science rules, having any sort of bad thought immediately opens you up to demonic possession, and wanting to kill evil aliens to stop them from killing other people later still counts as a bad thought. So when Nagito hits him in the forehead with his evil black splooge string, unlocking his soul's memories of the reptilians destroying his home planet in Pleiades, White Knight gets a case of the evil jaundice. And boy, El Cantare, bless him, your 
Jerry Lowenthal sure is trying his best to sell this scene, but there's only so much you can do with this script and these voice flaps. No, stop! Stop trying to manipulate my mind! So Tyler turns into the Black Knight from Ray's Nightmare at the start of the movie and instantly becomes willing to stab even his own girlfriend. Ray, of course, jumps in to stop his friend, but Nagito splooges on him to tip the scales of the fight, and then the exact scene from his nightmare happens, like, 22 minutes into the movie, so I guess they're just blowing that whole foreshadowing load right away. Aisuke saves Rei at the last second by turning him invisible, and Nagito takes off with Tyler to enact the next step of his evil plan. Now then, 330 million years ago or 150 million years ago, which time shall we head to first? Okay, so we're just jumping right to time travel. This is like if the MCU went straight from the first 30 minutes of Iron Man to the climax of Civil War, then segued from that into Infinity War. Or maybe it's closer to the plot of Ape Escape? Anyway, when he wakes up in the space hospital, Ray's pretty upset about the whole thing, but the professor reassures him that Tyler's soul is still in there waiting to be saved because he only stabbed his friend to wound. There was no lethal. Blow. Thanks, giant goat man. The blonde Ushanka lady seems to know more, but before she can say it, we cut away to the reptilian homeworld, planet Zeta, 330 million years ago, where Tyler appears out of nowhere to stab their stargate and cause it to shoot this black ray into the ocean that makes the water appear in the sky like it's inception. Then the reptilian queen, Zamza, who's just an absolute fucking baddie turns into a giant dragon to fend him off. The fight looks pretty darn slick, all things considered, and buys time for her people to escape, but ultimately she fails to stop their bootleg Xanarkand home from going the way of actual Xanarkand. Still, credit where it's due, they finally brought the CGI in these movies up to the level of a PS2 Final Fantasy, and I'm sure nothing we're about to see will make me completely eat those words. Speaking of eating stuff, Queen Zamza doesn't have the best anger management skills. Who is responsible for this operation? Oh, uh, th that would be me. How dare you, you fool. I'm so sorry. <laughs> But nonetheless, Eros, one of El Cantare's angelic servants, appears to invite her and her people to take refuge on Earth. Meanwhile, back in the present, blonde Yushanka lady deduces that Nagito must be able to time travel based on how he said that he was gonna time travel and that he's probably planning to interfere with the first incarnation of El Cantare, Lord Alpha. Luckily, the Space UN has its own time machine. This is the universe, Dick. All of the cosmos throughout the universe and 100 billion years of time are all condensed here in this space. Ray, of course, volunteers to jump back in time to save his friend, which is super duper dangerous because going that far back runs the risk of totally disintegrating someone's body and spirit. After that, he has this dramatic sunset goodbye scene with Anna, where she's all like, I want to go with you. And he's all like, no, you got to stay back and protect the earth in my place. Then he promises her, you're the most important person in the world to me so you know I'll be coming back. And that's the last time he'll ever talk to her, or any of his other friends besides Tyler. Told you there was no point explaining their powers. Ushanka Lady gives him a special time travel MacGuffin and tells him he absolutely cannot lose it no matter what, so you can guess what's gonna happen with that. Then he prays to turn on the time machine, and he's sent rocketing through a series of Windows 98 screensavers into the first level of Sim Theme Park on PS1. <sighs> Damn it. After wandering around the jungle for a bit, Ray runs into a dinosaur and almost gets eaten, but then a Na'vi shows up to save him with a bolo. Before they can talk, though, some pterosaur-type reptilians fly in to start an awkward fight scene, and, of course, after he's beaten a few of them up, Queen Batty makes her appearance with an absolutely flawless intro. Out of the way! <laughs> It's Queen Zamza! Make way! Did you do all of this alone? Hmm. How interesting. 
unsurprisingly, this lady who punches her buddies just to punctuate sentences isn't much for talking to her enemies, so she and Ray have a fight, and she ultimately kicks his butt. Then her goons drag him before her, chanting, Let me go! Anima, I don't have time anima, to get caught up anima, here! Anima, 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 anima. Whew! I, I, man, I don't ever want to get interrogated by those guys. Lucky for Ray, instead of removing his pants, she simply takes his time MacGuffin, so... He followed that order for all of six minutes. When he reveals that he's come back to fight the same guy who blew up their homeworld, the reptilian goons start chanting Anima even harder, but Zamza silences them with a declaration. From now on, he shall be my slave. None of you are allowed to eat or kill him. So, in case you were wondering if time travel counts as isekai, now you have your answer. And, of course, now that Rey works for her, she immediately shows him affection the only way she knows how. Eros appears and invites both of them to meet Lord Alpha, who tasks the two of them with defending Earth from bad aliens, such as Giant Scorpion, Elephant Man, and Xenomorph in a tank top. At first, Zamza would rather conquer the Earthlings, but Alpha grows elephant tusks and beats her in a staring contest, so she changes her mind and they go off to save a group of red farmer guys from some saber-toothed tigers and pterosaurs. And let me tell you, their team-up banter is just electrifying. I see. So you're actually a good guy, aren't you? Don't forget, Don't forget to remember, remember your place. place or I will devour you next. I take back what I just said. After the fight, Zamza ends up suffering something of an identity crisis because she doesn't think she's actually a good guy. So she does what any hot girl would do in that situation, zoom around listening to emo music. And of course, like he always does at people's darkest moments, Nagito appears to tempt her into turning evil with, I must say, a very compelling argument. Did you know that the human's anima tastes really good? After one taste, you'll never forget the flavor. The ruler of this planet's in for a treat, having all of that delicious anima to herself. <sighs> Okay, look, I, I know from the subs that he's supposed to be saying anima, but he's definitely not. Nagito also appeals to her pride as a reptilian, though, and her indignation at having to serve the weak humans. And we both know the strong shall rule over the weak. That is the ultimate rule of the universe. But as we see at a red people wedding the next day, that's not the only kind of temptation Queen Zamza's facing down here on Earth. Putting their mouths together. It looked like they were going to eat each other at first. It's called a kiss. And that's what people do here on Earth. It means I love you. I love you. Things finally reach a breaking point at the wedding feast that night when a human asks Zamza to carry their garbage for them. Furious at the indignity of it all, she challenges the people of Earth to a martial arts contest to decide who gets to be the boss. So, G Gundam rules. But before Rey can square up and fight her goon, Alpha's wife Gaia shows up to fight in Earth's stead. And of course she busts out the ultimate martial arts move move, prayer, which causes a beam of light to shoot out of Alpha's pyramid and turn her into a sphinx. And Yu-Gi-Oh! The Movie rules apparently beat G Gundam rules, so she makes quick work of the dragons by using String Shot, which is super effective. Wait, that, that's Pokemon rules. Anyway, Zamza doesn't take losing well. Kill me. It must be only me that you kill. <sighs> since I'm the one who lost. <gasps> but Lady Gaia declines that offer, because happy science is all about love and forgiveness and junk, unless you're Chinese. And by sacrificing herself for her people, Zamza has finally started to understand what love really means. However, her angry, greasy, 
hairy right-hand lizard doesn't agree with that segment and slinks off to become the third act's tertiary villain. The next day, he comes back to snipe Ray in the middle of a big speech about noblesse oblige, but Zamza takes the bullets for our hero. The greasy one then declares that he and the other reptilians are doing a coup and work for Nagito now, and suddenly Tyler appears on his evil flying surfboard, leading a Walmart army of Mordor to a attack the capital. Gaia creates a magic shield from her wings to stop them, and the giant pyramid uses string shot, which is super effective yet again. Zamza attacks the Black Knight and gets totally yeeted, but before she can be perma-yeeted, Rey arrives to finally smack some sense into his friend. While they're busy punching each other, Greasy Face shows up to finish the job, but Zamza blasts his ass with a mouth laser, and some good reptilians show up a second later to to provide backup. Ray finally manages to pin Tyler down and scream in his face about friendship, and while the Black Knight does manage to counter hump his way out of the hold, <laughs> he's too late to stop the ensuing flashback seizure, which is followed by a vision of Lord Alpha that finally brings him back to his senses. And the film finally reveals exactly what the promise was that they made to each other. The police force or the defense force? I'm not really sure which one is best. <laughs> you should become the Prime Minister then. So you'll be the one to give the orders, and the defense forces will attack the bad aliens with the UFOs I've built. Let's unite our power and protect this planet together. Yeah, just become Prime Minister. That makes perfect sense. However, their reunion is interrupted by Tyler ambiguously passing out or possibly dying, and Nagito appears to gloat hilariously. Sorry, Zamza, but I've changed my mind. I've decided to take this planet for myself as well. And even in the face of a reptilian army, he still has one last trick up his sleeve. Oh, you need to knock it off. Cause right now is the best part of all. Wait a sec, that voice, those teeth, he's not Nagito at all, he's Nuxtaku, and he can turn into a giant spider? I just unlocked a new worst nightmare! Spider Nux splooges webs all over everyone out of his suspiciously well-animated sphincter before moving in for the kill on Rey, but Zamza flies in at the last second to block his mandibles, freeing our hero but sacrificing herself. Falling into despair at his failure to protect his friends, Rey becomes vulnerable to the influence of the splooge. But then Tyler's all like, no, I'm fine actually, I was just just napping. So instead of being brainwashed, he has a vision of Alpha, who spends several minutes rehashing happy science history before explaining that Ray's true mission isn't to destroy the reptilians, but to learn about evolution and competition from them while teaching them about love and faith. Understanding this allows Ray to evolve into a golden glowing lion man who's too strong to be trapped by the splooge anymore, and he rips Spider Nux's leg off before hammering him into a mountain. That only causes the villain to turn into an even bigger, uglier CGI spider thing though, and he uses the same Stargate laser that inceptioned Planet Zeta to turn half of Alpha City upside down. But then God just sort of pops out of his pyramid and stops that from destroying Earth, and finally faced with his true foe, the villain reveals the truth behind his evil motivations. So here you are, the god of Earth, Alpha! Why did our universe have to be destroyed? You know, that's, that's a pretty valid grievance, and if the god I asked that of said, that's just how reincarnation works, bro. I'd probably throw some CG particle effects at him, too. Unfortunately for Nux, Alpha is immune to CGI and has the power of the erase tool, so all his spaceships instantly go bye-bye. What the hell? Unacceptable. I won't accept this. No way! And with one last prayer, Ray finishes the big bad off by just sort of randomly zipping around him till he bursts into a jumble of polygons and implodes. <laughs> then El Cantare waves his magic staff to turn the city back to normal. Hey, 
another thing it does. And then inside his pyramid, he heals Zamza, so everyone gets to live happily ever after, and the movie has no consequences. After that comes the obligatory sermon scene in which Alpha says, be yourself, but also love each other over and over in different ways for like five straight minutes. And then finally, it's time to send our heroes home with a proper tsundere goodbye. Well, even without you here, I won't be troubled by it at all. I won't be lonely either. I could have even chosen to take you as my husband, you know. Which could get pretty awkward with his girlfriend at all if they ever appear in a movie again, so I guess it's lucky they don't. The post credit scene is just a shot of Alpha staring at you, judging you, followed by a to-be-continued card that is a blatant lie. Stan Lee's ghost must have really wanted to start his happy science story with a fresh slate, because Dahar and Giant Goat Man are the only recurring characters to appear in the next Laws of the Universe movie, Age of Elohim, which we know Stan Lee's ghost helped write because Google says so. Set 150 million years in the past, the movie opens in dramatic fashion with a big evil looking red meteorite hurtling toward the earth while the CGI masses sail through the untextured CGI canals of Elohim City to take refuge in the untextured CGI temple of El Cantare's latest incarnation who, as you might have guessed, is named Elohim. Outside, a brave army of humans, plus some anthropomorphic space bears and panthers, lines up to take their orders from a pair of blonde ladies, then hops in starships to defend the planet. Unfortunately, the Star Fox crew's lasers have no effect on the meteor, but just when it seems like all hope is lost, an armored angelic waifu flies in to smash the meteor up and save the day, causing the black splooge within to harmlessly dissipate over the city's barrier. Back on Earth, the identity of the mysterious waifu is revealed after a minute and a half long rock song plays over her walking like 10 meters to the palace. Uh, uh. Her name is Yazael, Commander-in-Chief of the Galactic Federation, and she's been summoned by Lord Elohim to help defend Earth. After that dramatic intro, we cut to a bunch of furries dancing in a field surrounded by bubbles for some reason in another minute and a half long insert song sequence. So I, I guess this one's sort of a musical. Okay. According to the song, these furries are praying to Lord Heem of the gracious star Vega. After the song's over, Yazael walks into Lord Heem's golden chamber, where he and his attendant tell her that she's been summoned to protect Earth by Lord Elohim, who's Heem's, like, reincarnation cousin or something? Then they bestow upon her a magic transforming whip sword, a magic crystal, and a magic mirror that turns into a Magatama necklace, Vega's sacred treasures. And she goes to Earth to blow up the meteor again from a slightly different angle. Then there's another minute and a half long insert song as she slowly strolls into the golden chambers of Lord Elohim, who kind of looks like Napoleon f***ed the Buddha, and their pledges for a third time to give her all to protect Earth. Okay, just to take stock, we are 19 minutes into the movie, and so far it has established that a meteor was heading for Earth, so God summoned a warrior from Vega with a magic sword to protect us. Uh, that's about it. Also, we watched the same action scene twice. All right, before we pass judgment, let's just see what the next scene's about. That meteorite was impossible to destroy with our conventional attacks. If I had to guess, I'd say it was some sort of meteorite bomb. That sword... It's the renowned treasure sword that's able to transform its shape. It's a legendary sword. You know, I'm starting to suspect that perhaps Stan Lee's ghost did not actually co-write this movie. But whether or not he did, Okawa didn't let that stop him from doing the obligatory cameo. First, we should bring it to Stanley Man for further analysis. In their meeting with Stanley Man, who you might have noticed is quite a bit blonder than the Romanian Jewish guy he's based on, if you're new here, they do that a lot in these anime for 
some reason. He informs them that it will take him time to make weapons from the Crystal of Vega. However, by utilizing the extremely scientific technique of looking at it for five seconds, he is able to deduce that the treasures of Vega will only work for someone fighting for others' happiness or otherwise in the name of justice. Which is convenient, because justice is Yaisael's middle name. It's God's will to defeat evil throughout the land and to promote his justice. I refuse to ever fight if it is not in the name of justice. That being the case, Earth's obviously gonna need a lot more soldiers like her to stop any future meteor bombs, so Blonde Lady A, Pongaroo, asks Yaisael to train their troops, which looks like it could be an uphill battle. Look, she's just a little girl, isn't she? How's it going, cutie? Are you feeling okay? Isn't that armor heavy? <laughs> <laughs> Yaziel then disciplines that guy with her whip sword, and, you know, given how many times a tough lady has beat or tied up a guy in these movies, I I'm starting to think the director might have a thing for that kind of thing. Anywho, the soldier's current commander helps whip them into shape with some inspiring, charismatic words. We are here to protect and serve our beloved Earth. We must be prepared and are resolved strong to rise up against any evil. And their new commander responds with an equal level of charisma. Vladimir. Thanks so much. This is a pleasant surprise. I see there are some Earthlings I can talk to. I appreciate it. While them soldiers get to training, we cut away to Centaurus Beta, the source of the meteor, where General Evil, a maniacal purple gorilla man with a chin equal to three, maybe even four Thanoses, is complaining to Dahar, who I guess got better after being imploderated, that his plan failed. I made a meteorite bomb with dark matter, but... Earthlings were able to destroy it somehow. Frustrating, isn't it? Damn! <laughs> I'm furious! And reasoning that Elohim must have used his godly networking abilities to call in backup, the pair resolve to attack together, eventually, way later in the movie. Back on Earth, after another minute and a half long musical establishing shot, this time full of horrific CGI monstrosities like these dolphin butterflies, Latimer and Yaisael go on a scenic walk to talk about how reincarnation works and how atheists are super dumb and evil. Then, when they get back to town, they're shocked and horrified to find soldiers enjoying their time off. What's the point of life if you can't have some fun? <sighs> <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna call it. The director's definitely into that. But those soldiers really should have known that the only acceptable recreational activity is walking around talking about religion. You are soldiers of God, and it's important that everyone sees you as heroes, even in private. Consider your actions. Their behavior so concerns Yaisael that she goes to ask Lady Pongaroo, how come people do bad stuff? And in response, she's shown a spooky Mormon hell dream, which spooks her so much that she goes to ask Elohim to give everyone a sermon on the meaning of justice. Before that can happen though, the bad guys put a fuzzy drop shadow effect in the sky, and Elohim's troops must waddle out to meet them on the fields of Naboo, I mean, Earth. But while they were prepared for a phantom menace with furries bit, a torrent of evil black splooge that turns into spiders makes it a starship troopers with furries bit instead, which they're ill-equipped to deal with. And as we all should know by this point in these movies, wherever there's evil splooge smoke, there's spider nux fire. <laughs> Yaisayo, hello. What a surprise. Didn't think I'd find you on Earth in this day and age. Dahar, I knew it. <clears throat> of all the different types of people, I despise your kind most. On arrival, Dahar tries to tempt the reptilians fighting for Earth with the same millennia-old speech about how the strong should rule over the weak, but Yaisael shuts him up by revealing that her magic mirror can turn into a Nerf Kamen Rider bike. She transformed. But how? Huh? Jumping over the front line, she starts blasting away all the bugs with lightning and lasers and junk. But she fails to realize that while she's doing that, she leaves her own reptilian troops wide open to get splooged on by Dahar, who reveals that if they keep drinking and smooching ladies, the god they're fighting for is just gonna send them to hell anyway. So they all start punching each other, and Yazael's too busy bug blasting to stop them. But just when it seems like all hope is lost, 
lost, the clouds part, God turns on his spider delete beam, and a host of angels from Sagittarius descend to save the day. You devil! Get away! Their leader is Master Amor, and according to the Making of featurette on Happy Science's YouTube channel, he's apparently an even cooler and more powerful past incarnation of Jesus. A uh, super space Jesus, if you will. Together, he and the angels make quick work of the enemy horde, and inspired the troops rally, chasing the dark splooge back into the equally terrible effect from whence it came. They did it! Impressive! After that, the angels heal up the troops and everyone heads back to the palace, where it's revealed that those two blonde ladies are incredibly slow on the uptake. So you're saying that Dahar has been the mastermind behind all of this? Meanwhile, outside, Yazael starts hitting it off with one of the angels, Michael, who explains that his twin brother Lucifer has learned how to turn the power of dark matter against their enemies, which I'm sure isn't foreshadowing any kind of heel turn in the future. Michael then uses that discussion of siblings to segue into a very anime pickup line. Now that I think about it, <laughs> it almost feels like we could be siblings too. Then seals the deal by doing the sexiest thing either of them can think of, trading catchphrases. I will defeat all evil and establish justice. With the sword of justice, I will eradicate evil once and for all. <laughs> <laughs> Aw, look at Latimer, he's jealous. Inside Elohim's chamber, the army leaders have a very drawn out talk to figure out how to protect their troops from future brainwashing attacks, and the solution they arrive at is to gather the whole space UN under a massive ceramic gold boob for an even bigger, more drawn out talking scene, known as the Earth Conference. It's the Earth Conference. The Earth Conference. So, what exactly are they going to do at this... Sorry, what was it called again? Earth Conference. Thanks, Giant Goat Man. So, what's the plan? Are we gonna draw up interstellar battle strategies? Figure out a way to intercept the approaching fleet? We must first consider what justice is on Earth in order to ensure that everybody is on the same page. Oh, okay, it's just gonna be another thinly veiled Okawa sermon. Gotcha. Well, I I'm gonna spare you guys from watching even a summary of that. To make a very, very long story short, they get a bunch of aliens together to share their diverse opinions, and after almost 15 straight minutes of talking, they all conclude that it's important to have diverse opinions, so long as everyone worships the same god and does everything he says, of course. Man, Stan Lee would weep to know his name was on this script. Speaking of, it's time for another cameo! In the Elohim Army's hangar, Stanley Man reveals to Latimer that he's figured out how to infuse Earth's weapons with fragments of Vega's crystal, which conveniently regenerates no matter how much you take off it. They should be more than enough to counterattack against any enemy from space. Of course, before the troops can use these powerful new weapons, they need to learn how to love justice and fight with a spirit of self-sacrifice, which requires the rigorous training of steroids into a magic mirror and then doing like two practice drills. And now we're a real team. One more completely unnecessary insert song later, Thanos at home and Dahar finally roll up with their respective evil armies for the final showdown, which Michael assures us will be super serial. This battle won't be easy, I am sure. It will be a deadly one, which we must be ready to die in. Come on, bro. I've seen eight of these fucking things already. You and I both know everyone's gonna be completely fine, except for maybe one guy who gets resurrected at the end anyway. Let's just get this over with. The battle up in space is every space battle you've ever seen in every sci-fi thing ever, which is just fucking sad knowing this director also worked on Cowboy Bebop. And as you'd expect, the fracas down on Earth is only saved from being equally generic by how completely batshit insane it gets. Like, we got nerf common riders zipping around, zapping bugs, dudes turning into elephants and unicorns to smash shit up, and I guess Jesus was also an earthbender in his past life? Though that said, his power of preach no jutsu is far more effective at taking the monkey space Marines out. Honestly, these bad guys are getting their asses kicked so hard and so predictably, you start feeling sorry for them. Ah, be careful! Huh? 
Those damn Andromedans are probably going to target the commander ship first! You're probably assuming that things will take a turn for the worse when Lucifer makes his extremely predictable heel turn. Evil for evil! <sighs> What? Wait, is that acceptable? But even though Dahar makes his most compelling mind control pitch yet, I'm sure you understand, don't you? The strong want to dominate the weak and be on top of everyone. Kinky. Yazael's able to cut off his magic splooge before it takes effect though, so that whole plot line's just sorta thrown out the window and God keeps winning. Not even turning into a giant spider works this time, but like any good evil mastermind, he's got backup plans within backup plans. So instead, he just turns all his little spiders into one giant minotaur. Meanwhile, up in space, the good guys are just winning more, but then Thanos at home arrives to the party and Slave 1 at home, so it seems like maybe they might not win as much anymore. Spoilers, they keep winning. Down below, the Minotaur manages to do ever so slightly more damage than the rest of the enemy troops did, but it still goes down pretty easy after Yazael chops its Titan weak point. A little too easy, mayhaps, because it goes to grab her when her guard's down and Latimer has to jump in to finish the job, getting yeeted in the process. Which makes Yazael so sad she doesn't even notice Dahar firing a Starfinger through her heart. And with her deaf Definitely dead for real, no takesies backsies, he can finally turn his attention to soaking the city in splooge. With its protective barriers eaten away, he strolls right up to the palace, but Elohim still has one last line of defense, the blonde ladies. And they've got a trick or two of their own up their capes. You're an eyesore, Pongaroo! <laughs> That's right, your eyes do not deceive you. She is indeed a kung fu panda. Unicorn! And real talk, her moves are pretty slick, as are those of Blonde Lady B, who comes in dual-wielding flaming swords before turning into a Beyblade octopus. Honestly, this whole bit almost makes the rest of the movie worth sitting through, but all good things must come to an end, and despite knocking Dahar back in the most dramatic manner imaginable, blonde ladies are ultimately unable to hold back the unyielding tide of spiders and splooge. And when that corrosive force reaches the inner sanctum of God himself in the direst moment in any of these movies, Elohim just sort of waves his hands and then everything's fine. Kind of like he could have done that at any point. Fed up with getting his butt kicked by the Unipanda, spider Nux transforms into an even bigger spider horse scorpion thing. So to counter him, Elohim shoots a beam of light at Yazael's corpse, causing her to instantly resurrect as a giant mecha butterfly thing, and her magic pollen instantly makes all the spiders explode and the splooge melt away. But we can't forget there's still a secondary villain up in space who finally has a chance to use his own trump card. He was the one who told us about how the nuclear attacks will be neutralized inside of the palace unless we break the place's barrier. That's what he said. But what about our allies who are still there? Don't worry about them. They're merely pawns. <laughs> Just proceed. <laughs> From a dramatic low angle, which I'm pretty sure was just rotoscoped over the actual Thanos, General Evil fires the missile, which rockets toward the palace, leaving everyone on the ground frozen in fear. But then Elohim stops time, Astral projects his way up into space, says, nuh uh, blowing up the earth is naughty, and then loops back to right before the button was pushed, and then Monkey Thanos is too scared to do it again and runs away, leaving Spider Horse Scorp Nux behind to throw a hissy fit. <laughs> I can't believe you chickened out this far in! Damn it! 
What's wrong with all of you? You people are so useless to me! While he's busy freaking out, as I predicted, Super Space Jesus resurrects that one guy who died, then the butterfly mech flies in to kick Nux's butt one last time in what one could charitably call a discount kaiju flight. Before he can be defeated for good, though, the villain flees into space, and Yaisael gives chase, never to be seen again. No, seriously, that's just how her story ends. The post credit scene even confirms that she's just floating in space forever, and her friends are all like, yeah, rock on, girl. The movie's story isn't over yet, though, because of course we gotta do the obligatory five-minute sermon scene. But also, before we can do that, we gotta wrap things up with the Sagittarius Angels. And by wrap it up, I mean cram in another out-of-nowhere three-minute-long musical number hallucinated by Super Space Jesus about how Lucifer's eventually gonna turn evil one day, then his brother's gonna kick his butt and send him to hell, where he's gonna turn even more evil. Which... I guess counts as tying off that subplot. All things considered, the last three Happy Science movies are very not good, just like the previous six and that one short film they made with Kyo Annie. And it's a lot of fun making fun of them for how wacky and weird their movies are, but it's also important and kind of scary to remember that these films represent reality for a not insignificant number of people around the world. Nowhere near as many as Happy Science claims, but still quite a few. People who've been brainwashed and tricked out of their money to support the production of these egotistical disaster pieces, and many more terrible live action movies that I might get to one day. Not to mention the cult leadership's lavish lifestyles. And a lot of kids have been forced to grow up watching these movies and attending creepy, controlling cult schools like the ones presented in them. I wish I could just move on and say that evil has been defeated since Okawa's dead, but it remains to be seen how and if the cult will restructure and rebound from that. What's more, their influence doesn't stop with the degradation of anime as an art form. Happy Science has surprisingly close ties to the Republican Party through the former leader of of their own failed political party, Jay Ayaba, who's been a regular face at CPAC for years and even helped found the conference's Japanese branch. And they're just one politically active cult out of many. The Epoch Times, a propaganda rag widely shared by conservative pundits and politicians the world over, is owned by China's Falun Gong. And conservative leaders across the globe are likewise tied up in the dealings of Korea Korea's equally shady unification church, as was revealed when a victim of their scams did that thing to longtime cult ally Shinzo Abe last year. Which, to current Prime Minister Kishida's credit, has resulted in some regulation of cult activities and fundraising in Japan, though even those efforts have been curtailed by the LDP's coalition partner, Komeito, which is the political arm of a much more successful anime-producing new religion. Organizations like Happy Science hold a lot more sway than many folks realize, and unscrupulous politicians have shown time and again that they'll happily expose their own bases to cult propaganda and recruitment efforts in exchange for the power and funding offered by their zealous followers. So always be wary of what leaders you put your faith in, and always remember you can totally trust me, your friendly neighborhood anime pope. By the way, we hold meetings every Wednesday in the alley across from Shea Garbage, where we talk about the day the almighty Truck-sama will deliver us from this hell world unto our righteous, legally distinct from Dragon Quest rewards. Also, we offer free drinks to anyone who brings a Gamer Sup's waifu cup, so get yours with the promo code BASEMENT at the link below. I'm Jeff Thu, professional isocultist, wishing you all the waifus in the new world. Or husbandos, we're a very inclusive cult. I mean, not a cult.